My apologies for that little thing over there. I just can't stand people like that. Um, my name is Adrian. I'll be your MC for the night. I'm a founding partner of Jackal Events and a veteran member of the UBC Free Speech Club. Uh, these are the two organizations that make tonight possible. Tonight, we hope to further our ideals of nonpartisanship and a commitment to an open dialogue um, on the subject of postmodernism, as over the course of the last few years, its relevance has become rather significant in public discourse. I was going to open the show with a little anecdote about how this I came to be, but the story itself isn't what's important. What's important is the message, and it's this. This night couldn't have been made possible without the dedication and perseverance of a team working towards a goal. Our human ability to create, to make, and to challenge is what drives us. And one of the main reasons why I got involved in the Free Speech Club to begin with is because I couldn't stand to see those taken away. Now, I believe in this notion because our speaker today understands the importance of drive, understands the importance of perseverance, and I am very happy that through months of effort and planning, we were able to make this night possible. Dr. Hicks is a Canadian-born philosopher, a professor at Rockford University in Illinois, holds a PhD in philosophy, and is the author of numerous works that range from Nietzschean philosophy to business ethics. He comes here today all the way from Illinois to speak on postmodern theory. Without further ado, may I present to you the author of the work that you all have, A Modern Man in a Postmodern World, Dr. Stephen Hicks. All right, thank you for the invitation uh, and the gracious introduction. Uh, yes, challenging times for free speech, right, obviously. Uh, more broadly, challenging times for education. And here we are at a university. Uh, events like uh, we just uh, witnessed are, in some sense, regular common occurrences for a generation. Uh, One-sided reading lists, right, and attempts by intellectuals and professors to take entire traditions of understanding and not have them be taught. Uh, more recently, activist student groups right, trying intentionally to shut down the views of those they disagree with, uh, including professors right, in their own universities who will include books that they do not want to have taught, uh, invite speakers whom they do not want to have taught. Now, of course, traditionally, uh, uh, conservative professors have been the first ones to be targeted right, in this way in conservative traditions. But over the last couple of decades, we've also seen this extended to more broadly libertarian thinkers, classically liberal thinkers, and then as things accelerate, thinkers who are broadly speaking on the left, but who are not left enough right, from the perspective of the given activist group, to the point where Professors who have been invited right, by the university are disinvited. Those who are invited are subject to shouting down and sometimes to overt physical threatening. People arriving right, at university events, for God's sake, carrying weapons and occasionally violence breaking out. Now, this uh, is bewildering right, to those people who are outside of the academy, uh, and in many cases, bewildering to people inside the academy. Uh, and the reason for this is that universities are experimental laboratories. They're experimental laboratories for ideas. And when a certain set of ideas or a network of ideas get purchased, they get traction. And of course, naturally, they want to propagate themselves and exclude the competition. And what we are seeing in the last decade is a leveraging of a very prominent set of ideas that has taken hold in the last two generations, particularly in the humanities, right, that we call postmodernism. Right? Now, postmodernism is partly a philosophical label, partly a historical label, right, postmodernism, right, whatever modernism is. And so that's our subject tonight. And the claim I want to make is that the pathological manifestations that we are starting to see, the threats to the ideals of liberal education, free speech, discourse, being willing to engage in the give and take of heated argument on important matters. All of that is currently up for grabs because we are postmodern. Right? Now, what does this mean? Well, postmodernism, of course, is a sprawling label. It's an intellectual movement. It's a cultural movement. But when we survey the landscape, all of the postmodernists, first tier, second tier, third tier, cite the big guns, right? the big names whom we are supposed to know if we are 
well-educated people. So the names like Michel Foucault, Richard Rorty, Jacques Derrida, Jean-Francois Lyotard, right, and others right, consistently come to the fore as the leading intellectual heavyweights guiding this movement. So I want to start with a sampling of some quotations from leading postmodern thinkers. So there's Michel Foucault on the end of modernity. He starts with a geological right, metaphor. The deepest strata of Western culture have been exposed. And of course, this is what philosophical individuals do, and intellectuals do. You drill down to the bedrock, right, the basic assumptions, and you think about those. You try to find alternatives. You put them to the test. And the claim is the bedrock right, of modernity right, has been exposed and are once more stirring under our feet. So we are in earthquake times. Right? The modern world is being subject to fundamental shocks right, to the system. Richard Rorty agreeing, saying the postmodern task, right, as he called it, is to figure out what to do, quote, now that both the age of faith, right, so we pause there, the age of faith, right, perhaps 1,000 years of Western history, if we take the Eurocentric or Western perspective right at this point, the decline of Rome, the collapse of Rome on through Renaissance and Reformation. That was the age of faith in which essentially a religiously based philosophy was dominant intellectually and dominant culturally. But that failed, right? And that's Rory's first point. And the, uh, sorry, and the Enlightenment right, seemed to be beyond recovery. The Enlightenment, right, kind of a capstone intellectual and cultural movement in the modern world. Again, historians will argue maybe 1600s, but certainly the long 1700s and early 1800s, the age of enlightenment. But the claim is that too right, has failed. So what has gone on essentially up to Rorty and Foucault's generation, mid to late 20th century is the entire history, right, intellectual and cultural history right, of the West going back to the fall of the Roman Empire, the two dominant paradigms or philosophical outlooks have both been tried and been found wanting. Failure, and now we are casting around what should we do next? And that will be the postmodern task. What will we do next? Now, Foucault, Frenchman, Rorty, American. This is an international movement. So here's John Gray, a Brit. <clears throat> We live today amid the dim ruins of the Enlightenment project, agreeing with Rorty, which was the ruling project of the modern period. Now, this is a slightly stronger claim. It's not just that the Enlightenment failed as an intellectual movement, right? but rather Enlightenment transformed culture and the institutions that we live in, and those have reached a pathological state, an end state. So when we look around us, the claim is we should see the ruins, right? and that we live in, in effect, a ruined culture. And the postmodern position is to recognize this and to react to that in, in some way. All right, Enlightenment's wake. Yeah, so what is Enlightenment's wake right, going to be? That is the postmodern right, predicament. So what's the Enlightenment? Right, well. Uh, do some history here. I realize, given this here, that uh, the font is a little small, but I wanted to get all this in. So let me talk you this through this. The Enlightenment vision, as both Rorty and Gray and Foucault right agree, say that is the ruling project of the modern era, and we are trying to define postmodernism. So what is modernism, right? And what was this Enlightenment philosophy or framework that uh, tried to summarize and institutionalize what the modern world right is all about? First, a philosophical revolution. I want to go back to the early 1600s. And I've got three names here, Francis Bacon, Rene Descartes, right, John Locke. So if you take courses in uh, early, uh, sorry, modern intellectual history, and particularly if you study modern philosophy, the transition to modern philosophy is identified with these formative figures. Right? Francis Bacon and John Locke, both into, uh, Englishmen, Rene Descartes, uh, Frenchman. Now, typically, uh, Rene Descartes is given the, the, the honorific title, the father right, of modern philosophy. I think, therefore, I am, cogito ergo sum, right, and all of that sort of stuff. Why is that fundamental? Right? Why are 
intellectual historians willing to cite these individuals as the founding fathers of the modern world. And the claim we'll make is that all of them are advocates fundamentally of reason. That human beings have the capacity for reason, and if we're interested in knowing what's true, what's false, what we should believe, right, what we should put in action right, and stake our lives on, should be primarily through the guidance of reason. Right? Now, from our perspective, that's not necessarily a radical sounding claim, but if you go to the early modern world, this was a dramatic claim. Right? Human beings have the capacity for reason. It works, and we ought to use it fundamentally. And the contrast, then, is to what had been the dominant theory of knowledge or the dominant epistemology of the previous era, the age of faith, right? the one that Rorty alluded to. If you want to know the fundamental truths and what you should believe and what you should stake your life on, it has to be an act of faith, right? not an act of reason. And what are you having faith in? Right? Well, you have a couple of options, and there are widespread theological debates that had dominated for a 1,000 years. Do you have faith in the church as the institutional vehicle for the true religion? Right? But what is the church based on? Well, the church is based on a long lineage right, that goes back to scripture. And so ultimately, scripture is your authority. Right? And you accept the truth of scripture on faith. Well, what is this faith in scripture right, based on? Why should we accept that? Of course, we ask the standard question. And the claim is, again, a non-rational one that there are certain prophets who in ancient times were visited directly by God uh, and or one of God's angels or emissaries and God spoke directly to those individuals and they recorded in some way what God said and then passed it on. And those of us who have not had such direct communications from God accept that they got it right on faith. So ultimately, it's either a mystical revelation or faith in some thing that can be traced back to a mystical revelation that is where we get our important knowledge from. And that was the dominant framework for the age of faith. The moderns challenge that and reject that. Right? We do not believe in mystical revelations. We do not believe on the basis of faith. There might be a place for these things, but they are going to be secondary, tertiary, and we are going to bracket them as much as possible and rely on our own capacity for reason for really figuring out what is true. So this is a bit of a mischaracterization of Descartes, but the rhetoric is perfect here, right? I think, right? Therefore, I am, right? Those resounding words, right? Well, that, if you take that as axiomatic, is to say, I think, right? And that is core to my humanity, my capacity for thinking. My very being is wrapped up in my capacity for being able to do this sort of thing. Francis Bacon making similar uh, kinds of arguments about the foundation of reason and, and, and working out an early version of scientific method. John Locke in a more mature fashion later in the century, also an advocate right, of reason. Arguing explicitly that we have to go by our own experience. Other people's experience doesn't do you any good. The fact that something is true and somebody else believes it right, doesn't do you any good. Right? You have to figure it out for yourself by the exercise of reason. And it is a human birthright that we all have the capacity for this. And this is what has to be trained and exercised. This has, of course, huge implications for education. Right? If we think that human beings, all of them, have the capacity for reason, that education is not a matter of here are the truths that you accept on faith, go out and live them after having learned them. Rather, we're training people to think and to utilize their own experience and to become, so to speak, scientists in their own lives. That was hotly contested right, for a century. Now, a century is not a very long time in human historical time, it's particularly for philosophical debates, but the early moderns won the debate. Right? And the advocates of faith, the advocates of mysticism, the advocates of reliance upon traditional institutions were on the defensive, intellectually speaking. Now, this is important, and I want to put the dates to you here. This is uh, Francis Bacon. I've put 1620 here because that is the date of his first significant publications, or one of his significant. Descartes publishing in the 1640s, Locke publishing in the 1690s, but actually doing his writing in the decade before when he was in exile. 
in Holland, because uh, he was on the wrong side of various political conspiracies and fences for a little while. But notice the dates here are 1600s. That's important. Okay? Now, what happens as a consequence if you think fundamentally that the human rational capacity is most foundational and that that needs to be exercised? Well, that has huge implications. If you then take the rational capacity or capacity for reason and turn it to understanding the world, right? you don't have a magical right, understanding of the world, right? or you don't necessarily interpret everything that goes on in the world in terms of omens and signals right, from God. You try to understand it on its own rational terms. Well, you start to see the beginnings of science. And it is then not an accident, right, historically, that it's in the mid-1600s that we start to see the first kind of recognizably modern scientific fields coming into existence. Astronomy and physics are the first major battlegrounds, but astronomy and physics, right, in modern terms, require an epistemology of reason. Right? And so physics becomes institutionalized starting in the 1600s. Capstone names, I really should probably have Galileo up here. Uh, Galileo also did yeoman work right here a little bit earlier. Didn't work out for Galileo very well because he was silenced. But by the time we get to the second part of the 1600s, we've got Isaac Newton, right, towering figure, right, with a very mature physics right in place. Awesome things being done in mathematics, right, by both Newton and Leibniz and any number of other people. Then it's a matter of generations. By the time we get another 40 or 50 years, you can see chemistry right, coming online. It's separating itself out from alchemy and magical understandings of how the elements work. And then another 50 years later, biology right, is coming online. And so by the time we get into the 1700s, we have recognizably the sciences of physics, cosmology, chemistry, biology, all of it supported by an understanding that reason is fundamental and we are working out what this means for scientific method. We also then see, uh, and when we get into the 1700s, right, these start to be applied to more systematic areas. If you take science, physics, chemistry, and you apply it to understanding right, thermodynamics, right, then you get the Industrial Revolution. The Industrial Revolution was a lot of inventors, of course, working in their garages right, in workshops. But a lot of it was very theoretical science. Right, that was discovered, and people were looking for ways to apply this. And it's not an accident, then, uh, that the Industrial Revolution is first happening in England, because England was the first nation of the Enlightenment. Right? Newton, Bacon, Locke right, are all right, Englishmen. So if you apply reason to the manufacture of goods, right, in the making right, of machines, well, then engineering right, as a discipline and all of the various kinds of engineering disciplines start to professionalize themselves. And our big capstone label for that is the Industrial Revolution. James Watt, 1769, with the first right, commercially feasible right, steam engine, right, the one that actually uh, had more energy output than energy right, as, uh, as input but a century of amazing cleverness with respect to uh, industrial gadgets. And as a result of that, the number of material goods that are produced for people just starts to skyrocket. So from philosophers arguing about epistemology to scientists working out the physics and chemistry to engineers right, putting these things into practice and making machines that can produce awesome amounts of good, we see that trend line in place, and the data are very good that by the time the 1700s comes up, stuff is being produced on a historically unprecedented scale. Right? Cotton right, for all human beings uh, to wear, dinner plates, the fact that you can put glass right, in, your, in your window, right? all of the things that we start to take for granted right, in the modern world were first mass produced in England and then places uh, that were influenced that by that by the 1700s. Now, if you do the same thing, you take science and you start to apply it to human beings, human beings are more complicated than machines, but you get away from, again, magical and witchcraft uh, as types of understandings of why people get sick. All right, we're not getting sick because God is punishing us right, for various things, or we're not healthy because God has favored us. Right? We are looking for naturalistic, rational, scientific understandings right, for various things. And you start to see oh, in the late 1600s and all through the 1700s a transformation of the medical profession, and putting it increasingly on scientific footing. Uh, uh, medical chemistry uh, with uh, Lavoisier, 
uh, Edward Jenner and the smallpox vaccination, a huge right lifesaver. Uh, I don't know if you can imagine right, being the first person to inject yourself right, with, with uh, something that you know right, came from a sick person who died of a, a particular disease because you've got the confidence, right, the rational confidence. Right, you've done the numbers. You've done the experiments that it's going to work. So he is a great hero right, of vaccination science. But these are two guys right, uh, uh, I'm singling out here. And then, again, the empirical data is very good. Right, human life expectancy for most of human history right, was in the 20s. Right? And it wasn't until the 1500s that it got up into the 30s. Right? And then starting at the late 1700s, we see that number going up right, steadily right, and so forth directly as a result of this. So people are living longer. They're living healthier, uh, partly because of medical chemistry. We're in less pain in a lot of cases. And the story is increasingly progressive. And we have more stuff right, available to us. Now, the same thing, though, uh, occurs if you take reason right as fundamental and you don't emphasize that we're trying to understand the world out there right, scientifically, but we apply reason to ourselves. Right? And we take as the important foundational figure that every individual has the capacity for reasoning. Right? What does that imply for the normative side right, of our existence? Right? Well, it is an immediate right, boost to individualism. Because we're getting away from the idea that only certain special individuals have received insights from God, and everybody else is in ignorance, and everybody else should be faithful with respect to those people who have the special institution or the special insights. Or that only an elite number of people are the heirs of certain traditions that have come down right over the centuries. And if you are not an authorized official right, of one of those institutions, then you should have faith in those authorized institutions individuals. What we are saying is every individual has his and increasingly her own brain and can use it to figure out the way the world works and governs their life. And that means that the respect for each individual's thinking starts to increase explicitly and dramatically. Now, one sign of this is uh, a whole series of um, uh, political institutions. You start to see, I've got John Locke here again in 1690. The first major battles in this uh, were in religion. So if we just take this argument about what your religious views should be and how should we think about religion and deal with the fact that we have differing views right, about religion. And we know that historically, right, the standard answer has been, we disagree on religion, therefore I need to kill you or I need to torture you right, uh, uh, to, to get you to believe. And of course, you're trying to do the same sort of thing for me. But if the point is that religion is important, and it's important for people to know the truth right, about whether there really is a god, and which one is the right god, and what that correct god said, that it doesn't do you any good just to take this on faith, that you have to figure it out for yourself. And that you're not right with God, so to speak, unless you have the right attitude right toward it. If you're just mouthing words that you've heard from other people, that's not legitimate. But if you have convinced yourself of the truth of a certain position, then that's genuine. Right? And that needs to be respected. But what this means, though, of course, is that we know people are going to, when they start thinking for themselves, disagree with each other. Right? And so you and I right, might come to a point where I really think that my position is true on this. And you really think your position is true on this. But what's going to stop me from torturing you and what's going to stop me from trying to kill you is the belief that you are a being of reason and your religion is not going to do you any good unless you really believe it by your own lights. And that means I have to respect the fact that you disagree with me on this. That's the more important thing. Because if I try to torture you into it, that's not going to do you any good. And if we're supposed to be, as part of our religion, benevolent and love our fellow mankind, then tolerance becomes absolutely essential. The arguments for tolerance that carried the day in England and in Holland right, in the late uh, in the 1600s, uh, that's a direct uh, implication here. And that is a historically almost unprecedented right, achievement. Right? Religious tolerance 
If you are familiar with religious history, right, very few cultures, very short times, uh, but in the modern world it came about here. Obviously this has political implications. If you think that you're going to leave people's religious lives up to themselves as individuals to work it out, well then what about their political lives? What about their economic lives? It's not a big stretch to say we should also get away from feudalism, right, where we tell people what they can and can't do, with whom they can trade, what prices they can set. We will leave people up to make their own decisions about what they're going to make, whom they're going to trade with, right, and so forth. And so we start to see the institutions of modern capitalism. And I don't think, again, it's accidental. Adam Smith uh, on the Wealth of Nations, published in 1776. If you make the same applications with respect to politics, well, right, politics, again, right, should not be a matter of right, elite leadership. Right, politics should be something that every individual has the capacity to do. We want people to participate in the process. We want them to argue right, about politics. And we want everybody to have a say, everybody to be able to run for office. And at the same time, we want to have protections for each individual to do their own thinking on political matters and so forth. So we have constitutional perfections on freedom of speech. So again, it's not accidental that we have a number of liberal revolutions in the classically liberal sense, first in England, then in the United States, right, then in France. All right, so freedom increases, right, wealth increases, material goods, and so forth. And again, the dates are significant because all of these dates are in the latter part of the 1700s. A century and a half transition, that's the Enlightenment. Uh, I have an asterisk up here. You'll find this uh, in the book. Um, I don't know if you know when the last witch, this is just a fun little fact here, the last witch right, was burned to death right, in, in, uh, in England. Right? Right, it was in the 1760s. And actually, her last name was a witch and her daughter, who was also apparently a witch, and their last name was Hicks. Right? <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, I don't know if there's any family connection, right, but that stands out in some people's minds, right, as, uh, as significant. But the point is, we stop doing that anymore, right? right? We stop torturing people, right, over right, religious differences. We take democracy seriously. We take republicanism seriously, right? We take all of these institutions seriously, right? Liberalism in some form, markets, right? Engineering, uh, medicine, because we believe in the fruits. And the Enlightenment was the first era, right, in human history that put together this whole package. Right? And obviously there are hundreds, right, if not thousands, of very important intellectuals right, making all kinds of arguments and prevailing right, in the arguments until you have significant movements. But they do become cultural movements. And then they start to be institutionalized and they become sort of the working machinery right, or the working cultural fabric right, of the societies that start to think this way. First England, some extent a little bit later in Scotland, spreading across the channel to France and many of the Western European states petering out the further east it goes right in Europe, but certainly then transplanted across the ocean to the United States and then everywhere that the British Empire went, right, the Enlightenment became an intellectual and cultural phenomenon right, of this era. Now also a striking thing, we have the language here, right? So we have Jefferson's uh, language, the pursuit of happiness, right? Uh, but think about how, again, if you know something about the history here, how rare it has been, the idea that life should be about happiness. Right? And that this should be a fundamental birthright. And that we expect that if we give people space, right, and we have the right kind of society, that most people will be able to put together happy, fulfilling lives. Right? Again, this is a historically unprecedented phenomenon. We kind of take it for granted, right? This idea of, sort of just in economic terms, right? That you know, we expect uh, our lives will be better than our parents, and our parents' lives were economically better than the grandparents, and our kids should have it better off, and so forth. That progress, right, again, is historically unprecedented. Until you get to the middle part of the 1700s, if you ask people, so to speak, how does his human history go? Right? Are we getting better and better? Of course, the answers were basically three. No. Things used to be good in the old days, and it's just getting worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. Right? The decline theory of history. Right? Or 
It is, uh, sometimes things go up, sometimes things go down, sometimes things go up, sometimes things go down. It's the same damn thing over and over, just one damn thing over and over, right? So there's no improvement, there's no decline, it's just right, cyclical, right, so to speak. Or the randomness theory of history, right? You look at history, it's too complicated, and it doesn't make any sense because the world is ultimately a mystery, and so we can't say. This never happened before the 1700s, the idea that we have finally figured out what has kept people in ignorance and bondage for so long. We have become enlightened. Right? We've got the tools. Right? We have the reason, we have the scientific method, we have the understanding of basic human liberties and rights and the respect for the individual, and we have enough people institutionally right, who believe this, we can make a society that in principle can solve any problem. Give us enough time. Extraordinary optimism, right? Progress as a human birthright to be expected. All right, that's the Enlightenment vision. I'm calling it a vision at this point because I'm stopping the story here in the late 1700s. And at this point, it was largely an intellectual movement, although there were some significant political revolutions, economic revolutions, and so forth, and scientific revolutions that had happened. But this was still largely a projection that if we go further into the future, we will deliver the goods on all of these claims that we are making here. So when the postmoderns now, two centuries later, we go from the late 1700s to the late 1800s to the late 1900s, are saying right, that all of this has failed right, and that we are now in a position toward the end of the 20th century to look back on what the Enlightenment's promises were what the philosophical underpinnings of it were, that we can see that those philosophical underpinnings have failed, and that when we tried to put them into practice, right, they necessarily, as a failed philosophy, led to negative, dim ruins manifestations. That's going to be the claim. All right, but I want to give a definition here, and uh, part of what makes talking about modernism difficult any broad movement is constituted by a large number of claims. I'm a philosopher by training, so I always go for the philosophical labels. Right? But what we have here in modernism, if we ask the metaphysical question, what is the nature of reality? What's real and what's not real? How do we tell the difference between truth and fantasy? Right? What's just made up right? imaginary worlds or fictional worlds from real, actual reality? And the basic answer that the moderns give is, a realist answer or a naturalist answer. The world is basically and fundamentally the natural world. There might also be a God, and we we're open to arguing for it, and many of the moderns did believe in God, but they had a rational understanding of God and believed that you had to argue for the existence of God. And you had to argue for it first on the basis of a very good understanding of the way the natural world works. So we're gonna start with the natural world and see where that takes us. Epistemologically, how do we know how do we really know? Right? Because we're a smart species and we have all kinds of beliefs and things that we want to be true, how do we sort out the ones that we really should put our confidence in? The answer here is some sort of objectivism. Right? We need to use our experience and reason on the basis of that experience, and of course that's what scientists do in very sophisticated fashion, but all of us in our lives need to practice these traits. Be as objective as we can in our experience, assessing the data, including the negative data, and trying to come up with our best understanding right, of it. What is it to be a human being? We've de-emphasized these ones, but the individualistic themes come out here in our understanding of human nature and the ethics that human beings are individuals. They should be autonomous. They have the capacity to think for themselves if they so choose to do so. Some debate over kind of the moral status, but largely a retreat from the idea of original sin, an idea that human beings are born either neutral or with some capacities for developing themselves to the good, a more under optimistic understanding of human beings. And then when we turn to political and economic issues, some sort of broadly speaking liberal capitalism comes to be the dominant right, set of views. Uh, when and where, those are just the uh, historical right, labels right, of the Enlightenment. So this is a five-dimensional definition of modernism. And if you want to understand right, philosophy, philosophy is tr traditionally divided into five disciplines, sometimes six. 
right? What's the nature of reality? How do we know? What is it to be a human being? What should I do with my life? And how should we live together? Right? Metaphysics, epistemology, human nature, ethics, and politics. Right? You have an integrated view on all of those things. That's your philosophy of life. This is the modernist right, view of life. That is radical, because if you contrast that to the pre-modern view, right, the pre-modern view emphasized supernaturals. And there's a realm that is superior to or beyond the natural world. And if you want to understand reality, that's where you start. In some sense, the natural world is derivative right, of a supernatural world. That ultimately, true knowledge comes from mystical insights that are directed to special prophets right, by God and or faith. We found a strong emphasis on the sinful nature of man, that human beings are not autonomous, but rather subjects. Right? And fundamentally, we should be obedient, right? both to our religious authorities and to the religious authorities who uh, carry, the, uh, carry the weight of God on earth. Uh, various networks of feudal obligation. I'm a member of this class, and so who I am and what is owed to me and what I owe to other people is defined by my class membership, and I have obligations of service and sacrifice with respect to other groups. And the point just is that between the pre-moderns and the moderns, that's the recognizable right, set of debates right, on all of these right, philosophical dimensions. And the postmoderns are going to say they're both wrong. This philosophy has failed. It, we tried that for 1,000 years. We've tried this one for 200 years. It also has failed. We need a third alternative. What is that going to be? All right, now let's go back to Foucault. All right. First point I want to make is the postmodernists, although I disagree with them, all of them are brilliant. All of them are deep. All of them are extraordinarily well-read particularly in the first generation postmodernists, the ones that I think are justifiably the names on everyone's lips when we need to talk about postmodernism. And the reason for that is that they go for the fundamentals. They really are drilling down to the deepest strata. So what is the deepest strata? Well, according to this light, or this chart rather, the most fundamental thing is this modernist belief in the importance and the efficacy of human reason. That that's how we acquire knowledge, if we really want to sort out the true from the false, we have to be sophisticated in the use of our rational capacity, logic, mathematics, scientific method, and so on. So Foucault, it is meaningless right, to speak in the name of right, or against reason, truth, or knowledge. Okay. Now, that's a big guns claim. Right? The entire Enlightenment project relies on a claim about reason. And the claim is going to be that that claim is not only false, but just meaningless. Reason is a meaningless concept. Truth right, is a meaningless concept. Knowledge is a meaningless concept. And one of the things that anecdotally we know when we start reading right, postmodern thinkers is there's a strong dose of skepticism right, and cynicism about any sort of positive value claim. One way uh, that this is done graphically right, is certain kind of success words, epistemologically, right? truth right? or fact. Right? They're always put in scare quotes. Right? And that's a way of distancing yourself from it. You know, I'm going to use this word truth, right? and then ha ha. Right? That's the, the implicative. And this is where it's coming from. So what we do have in postmodernism is a very deep skepticism about the human capacity for knowledge. And this is in contrast right, to the claim that says, if we have faith, we can get knowledge. Or if we use reason, we can get knowledge. Both of those are going to be seen as false. There is no such thing as knowledge. Right? We've been trying for a long time. We can't figure it out. Therefore, we should realize the game is up. Now, the point then is going to be, right, I'm harping on this, right? meaningless is a very strong claim. Right? Poijman Framister. Right? That's just a meaningless phrase. Right? And the claim is, when I say knowledge, that's no different from Poijman Matt Franister. Actually, I can't even say it twice, because I just made it up on the spot. Right? Uh, just a meaningless nonsense phrase. And of course, that's just a breakdown of communication. And if we want to communicate with each other, we shouldn't be using meaningless words and phrases. And so the implication is going to be, whatever we're doing, we're not talking about knowledge. We're not talking about truth. And we should just kind of set those concepts aside. 
and do something else. Now, what does that mean? Because that's out there. Well, Richard Rorty. Uh, try not to do death by PowerPoint, but this is another right, important right, quotation here. The difficulty faced by a philosopher who, like myself, is sympathetic to this suggestion, that is to say, what Foucault just said, that truth, knowledge, et cetera, are meaningless. As one who thinks of himself as auxiliary to the poet right, rather than to the physicist, right, we'll pause there. When we were talking about the Enlightenment, or saying reason, scientific method, right, science, and so forth, that the job of the philosophers was to support and articulate to a large extent the whole scientific project that has transformed the world in the modern era. And what Rorty is suggesting here is that, no, we shouldn't be thinking of that, right? Because what do scientists think they're doing? Right? They think they're studying the natural world and they're gathering facts, right? and they're doing logical interpretations, and they're getting closer and closer to the truth right, of things. And we're really getting knowledge right, of the way the world works. But if Foucault is right, that's not what we're doing. Right? So we shouldn't be thinking of philosophers as working with physicists. And so he says, yeah, I, instead I'm going to think of myself as an auxiliary to the poet. As a philosopher, whatever that is, I'm working with the poets. And the poets, and what the poets are doing is closer to I can't quite use the word right, right or true, because that would be paradoxical. But that's where we need to be. Okay? Now, what's the difference between a physicist and a poet? Right? Well, if you put it in philosophical terms, right, the scientists say, we are trying to be objective. Right? I might really want something to be true. I might be emotionally invested in a theory. But if the facts and the logic and the evidence goes against my theory, I'm going to have to set aside my feelings and what I want to be true because I'm committed to objectivity. Right. But if you're a poet, right, what is your mode of operation? Right. Well, you just make whatever you feel up. Right. To put it crudely, right, you can make shit up. And that's fine. Because when you are doing poetry, you're expressing not necessarily a rational theoretical understanding of the world, but your subjective reaction to your circumstances right, and the world, and you're putting it out there. And when I put my poem out there, your response to it is not, is this true, and does this meet the canons of scientific method? But rather, your reaction is, you know, does this push my emotional buttons in the right way and make me think and imagine things that I want to think and imagine? And so what Rorty is suggesting is if we then set aside, as he thinks we must, the Enlightenment project, that means we are setting aside objectivity, that physics project, and instead we are enshrining subjectivity. And the poets are the most human realization of human subjectivity. Now, that's kind of paradoxical, right, because it sounds like we're saying the right way to think about the human condition is this way. But how can I talk about the right way without using the words truth? Right? I can't say that I know this. Right? And that's what he goes on to say. And this is the predicament right, that we are in. I have to do this without avoiding or hinting, rather, that my suggestion somehow gets things right, that my philosophy corresponds to the way things really are. Because as a skeptic, I can't know right, what things really are. All right. So we're going in this way, and we're using language to suggest some new territory. but we're aware of these pitfalls. OK. Stanley Fish, right? Duke University professor for a long time, uh, Milton scholar, uh, then actually moved to my state and became the highest paid public employee in the state of Illinois, made more than the governor as a superstar professor at one of the University of Illinois right, campuses. Talking here about deconstruction, he's uh, applying postmodern methods to literary uh, uh, criticism, and the label there for uh, deconstruction is a literary method of applying postmodern techniques to techniques. And the claim is to say, you know, these deconstruction is really pretty great because it relieves me of the obligation to be right. I don't have to worry about being right, right. What does this text really mean? And am I interpreting it right correctly? And should I have arguments and good evidence right? And so forth. Instead of that objective right criterion, deconstruction just says, I uh, just have to be interesting. Okay. And what's interesting? Well, that's deuces wild. That's subjective, right? 
Right? And so you start to come up with creative right, interpretations of the text, and there are not these constraints. So literature studies are going to go in a certain direction. Right? Frank Lentricchio is a colleague of Fish's while they was at Duke. Duke's university is very important right, to this postmodern story. Uh, and there's a fork in the road here, because for some postmodernists, it's just a matter of being playful and interesting and coming up with cool interpretations that push your value buttons, the fish option. But we also know that postmodernism has an agenda. Right? There is a politics right, at work, and this is what Lentricchia is going to argue here. He says, postmodernism, and this is now old news, seeks not to find the foundation and the conditions of truth. All right. So we're not interested in about the conditions of truth. That's what Foucault told us we don't do anymore. Rorty, right, agrees. Well, if we're not about truth, then what are we about? We are about exercising power for the purpose of social change. Okay. Truth is out, power is in. And then he immediately applies this to the education because he's a professor, he has students, right, coming in on a regular basis. What should I be doing, right, as a professor? Well, the entire ideal of liberal arts education right, is based on the Enlightenment vision. Every human being, including these young people who come into my classes, have the capacity for reasoning. And I have to expose them to the facts, lots of different experiences, and have lots of debates and discussions right, among the students and with me about the different ways we might interpret right, all of these facts and data. And we're going to put our interpretations up against the really smart people who've written the books that everybody, right, the, the other smart people think that we should read. And the idea is we are training the hu individual human being's capacity for thinking, for digesting their experience, for being open to new experience, to debate, changing their mind on all of the rhetoric and argument and so forth. That's what your job is as a professor, because that's what you think is the best way students can become truth seekers themselves and really come up with the kind of knowledge that they can rely on in their lives. But if all of that is out, what's left is power. My job as a professor, as he goes on to say, is to quote, help students spot, confront, and work against the political horrors of one's time. So John Gray is right. We do live in the dim ruins of the enlightened world. It's all crap right out there. My job as a professor is to train activists. And I use my power to do that. Recasting right, of education on postmodern lines. Andrea Dworkin, right? It's not generic. We know that postmodernism comes in sub-brands, right? There are racial versions, there are feminist versions, there are environmentalist versions, there are ethnic versions, there are religiously based versions, right, and so forth. The Enlightenment said, right, every individual matters. All human beings should right, be free to explore their, their own lives intellectually, politically, economically, and people should have certain rights and so forth. And so we strive for the extension of those liberties to all human beings. Everybody should ultimately be equal, and then we'll be right, peaceful and progressive. Dworkin, right, in her postmodern phase, right, in a book called Intercourse, you don't want to read it, really, despite the, <laughs> the sexy title. Uh, can you see the words at the back? Because I'm kind of a delicate person. Uh, OK, I'll just say it, right? The normal fuck right, by a normal man is taken to be an act of invasion and ownership undertaken in a mode of predation. So all this talk about right, equal liberty and rights and uh, human dignity right, and extending the franchise and education opportunities, that's all a fraud. Right? And the reality is right, men have their power agenda. Right? Women, of course, have their own power agenda. But there's unequal power, and that's the bottom line. And that carries into the bedroom. And to me, the most important word here from the Dworkin passage is the word normal. Right? So it's not just that rapists are a minority of weirdos right among us, right, whom we need to deal with. This is what she takes to be the human condition in male-female relations. So that enlightenment promise is, again, a fraud. We can extend this to international relations, right? 
We're not exporting democracy and markets and peace and prosperity for all when we are taking the Enlightenment vision and spreading it around the world and encouraging people to trade with us. Instead, we have a darker vision. Again, strong nations versus weak nations. And we all have this rhetoric about trying to get along with each other, but really it's a matter of the strong nations like the United States imposing their agenda in various sneaky forms on all of the weaker nations in the world. And so really, the weaker nations of the world are always right, the victims. Now, this is a reflection by Lyotard, Jean-Francois Lyotard, about the first Gulf War in the 1990s about Saddam Hussein. So what do you think about Saddam Hussein? Probably you've heard from this postmodern perspective the CIA propaganda version, right, that he was a brutal dictator, right, who uh, did bad things to his people, right, et cetera, et cetera. The truth is, oh, sorry, I can't say truth. <laughs> the something or other is, right, that Saddam Hussein is a product of Western departments of state and big companies, right, the powerful corporations and the powerful nations, just as Hitler, Mussolini, and Franco were born of the peace imposed on their countries by the victors. Hitler was a victim. Mussolini was a victim. Right? Franco, a victim. Right? They were bad guys. That's fine. Right? But they weren't like homegrown, making their own problems and becoming evil. They are a symptom of the real badness, right? which is in the Western rich capitalist nations that have this rhetoric right about so forth. The Iraqi dictatorship proceeds, as do the others, from the transfer of aporias, right? That's a Greek word. If you're an academic, you have to throw a few of those in. It just means problems in the capitalist system to the vanquished, less developed, or simply less resistant countries. So what we have here is the Marxist-Leninist theory of uh, the exportation imperialistically of problems from the rich countries to the, 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 uh, the poor countries. And that was a hint, but Derrida right, makes it uh, explicit quotation. Deconstruction, he's the big name in literary deconstruction. But here, he says, why is he a deconstructionist? And of course, there are philosophical issues. But he says, deconstruction never had any meaning or interest, at least in my eyes. And as a radicalization, that is to say, within the certain, sorry, the tradition of a certain Marxism in the spirit right, of Marxism. So Marx is important here. Not the literal Marx, but some sort of Marxism right, spirit sort of thing. And so the various kinds of neo-Marxism are going to be an important part of the story here. Now, the point of all of these selection of quotes is to set up right, for then the same chart, but now we fill it in the way the postmoderns will do. Right? Metaphysics, what is this real? What is the nature of reality? The Postmodern answer is going to be that that's a pointless question, that's a meaningless question. And in philosophy, we just call that position anti-realism. So we're not going to try to debate whether God really is real the way religious philosophy wants to do, or whether natural world is the only reality the way the more scientific minded. Both of them are making claims that they can figure out the way reality really is. The postmoderns are skeptical and to say we're just going to dispense with metaphysics as a discipline. We're anti-realist in point. How do we know? Well, the answer is going to be that we are subjectivists, right? but rather that we are socially right, subjective. And that ties into a kind of social determinism. Language matters a lot. And the argument that often uh, is the most prominent one is that we're born into certain linguistic groups. We learn a certain language at our mother's and our father's knee. But built into those languages, a certain set of assumptions and ways of framing the world. And those get deeply baked into our understanding of the world. And we can't think outside of them. And so we are all prisoners of our linguistic groups and uh, the various social things that come out of that. The groups, of course, different languages, different ways of thinking about each other, and we can't think past it, mean that those groups are going to be in conflict with each other. There's not going to be any rational way, logical way, discourse way of getting past our different understandings of the way the world works. So we're going to have group conflict. And I need to make good on this a little bit later in the talk here, but there's going to be a strong theme of egalitarianism. Right, equality of some sort is going to be the trumping value, right? And it's, but it's going to be a group equality that is the trumping value and some kind of socialism. And again, those are fighting words, but I will make good on them. 
And that's where we are now. And uh, if you put all of the charts together, that is a set of different answers to either the pre-modern or the modern chart. So we have pre-modern, modern, and post-modern. Five philosophical issues, completely different packagings uh, for each of them. OK, now, here's my main bad guy right, uh, in my account. All right? And uh, this is the one I take a lot of heat from, right, because there are any number of scholars, and there's an argument that you can make here that says that Immanuel Kant is an Enlightenment thinker. And I think there is some truth to that. If you say, here's 20 things that make you an Enlightenment thinker, I think Kant checks off about six of the boxes. Right? And that's a legitimate thing to say. But in my judgment, Kant is the first of the counter-Enlightenment thinkers. Uh, and he was doing his main writing in the 1780s. Uh, Critique of Pure Reason is his most famous work and the most important work in my view. Published uh, first edition in 1781. Uh, and I will just give you a quick thumbnail of why I see him as the beginning of the turn, from an Enlightenment to a counter-Enlightenment. And why Kant is also going to be important, and this is not a controversial claim in the history of philosophy, though, is that Kant basically conquered the German intellectual world by the time we get to 1800. And much of the story of German philosophy since then is the story of neo-Kantianism and reactions to Kant. Kant, as much as I will disagree with him, I have to say he is the most important philosopher of the last 200 years and maybe 20 years or so. Now, just to telegraph right a few things there in the preface, uh, one of the things, uh, the book is called The Critique of Pure Reason. Right? So it's a critique of reason, right? And a critique of pure right reason. So there's some technical terminology built into there. But Kant, in his preface, says that his agenda is to say that Enlightenment philosophers are making all of these very grand, if not grandiose, claims for the power of reason. And my job is to put limits to it. To say there's only certain things that you can reason your way up to. Beyond that, there are limits. And those limits are quite severe right, in the Kantian corpus. All right, so what we have then is a philosopher who is shifting away from how can reason solve all of our problems to saying, no, here are some limits to reason. And part of his motivation is to say that he, like many of the religious thinkers right, of the era, are very worried about this trend line. Right? Science is coming along, and it's increasingly naturalistic, and the scientists are coming up with all these explanations for things that really are in conflict with a lot of traditional religion. And so do I go with my scientific mind, or do I go with my religious heart? And that's a big, huge, right, gut-wrenching dilemma right, for so many people right at the time. And it seems like the choice is, if you follow the trend line, right, science is increasing, religion is declining, that if we go along, then religion is just going to be out of human affairs. So we need to put limits to what reason can do, as Kant puts it, to make room for faith. Right? If we say reason is limited here, then beyond that, faith will have a safety zone, and we will continue to be able to articulate faith. And if you emphasize that point, that is not an enlightenment point. Right? But it is central to Kant's argument. Kant uh, uh, labels himself a Copernican revolutionary philosopher. Right? He says his philosophy amounts to a Copernican revolution. Copernicus was the first in the modern world to suggest that the sun was at the center of the system and not the earth. Right? So we now have a solar system right, instead of a geocentric system. And if you think of the cosmos as the earth at the center, we're at the center of God's plan for the world, and everything revolves around us. Well, that's got some pregnant metaphysical implications and value implications. If you think, by contrast, that we are just kind of a putsy planet 93 million miles away from the center of the action, the sun is at the center, and we're just whizzing around in largely empty space, that also has some kind of cosmological metaphysical implications. So that shift from geocentric to solar-centric, right? Absolutely important, and what Kant is saying is that that's exactly what he's doing philosophically. Philosophy, up to his point, had assumed, as he said, that we are concerned with objective reality, that there's a reality out there, and that our job as philosophers is to get it right. That reality is what it is, it sets the terms, and it's our job to have our minds map, right, or somehow represent or somehow theorize the way things really objectively are out in the world. Kant's argument is that that is impossible. 
that we realize here, speaking collectively for philosophers, right at that point, have been trying for millennia to do that, and Kant is convinced by the skeptical arguments to say that that is impossible. There is no way for us to be objective about what is out there, and so what we need to do is a Copernican shift and recast everything on subjective terms. So it's a deep transition from a commitment to objectivity to subjectivity. When you do that, you're in a different philosophical territory. And what's going to then happen over the course of the next centuries is the implications of that get played out increasingly over the generations. Now, one uh, thing I would mention here, uh, I, I don't know if you've read all the way through the Critique of Pure Reason. It's a big book. Kant is not a, noted for his stylism. But there is a very important section at the end, or toward the end, of the Critique of Pure Reason called The Antinomies of Reason that Kant uses as kind of a capstone set of arguments about why he thinks we have to abandon the idea that we can know reality, that we can be objective in any fundamental way. And they're called the antinomies of reason. And what he does is say, if you take four big issues in the history of philosophy, of course, one of them, is there really a god or not? And Kant says, absolutely, you can prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that there is a god and that he must exist. But you can also absolutely, beyond the shadow of a doubt, come up with a completely convincing argument that proves that there are no gods. Is the soul immortal? Well, you can prove that the soul is immortal, but you can also prove that the soul isn't. Do we have free will, or is everything determined? You can prove both of them. Right? Did the universe have a beginning in space and time? Well, yes and no. Okay. And as far as logic and reason right, and the validity of arguments go, Kant is convinced that arguments on both of these sides are completely legitimate. And the conclusion that he draws from that then is to say, if this tool of reason can reach contradictory conclusions on the same issue, that shows that reason is out of its depth when it's trying to grapple with these deep metaphysical issues. So we just have to stop being metaphysical about those issues. All right. Now, that's my five-minute summary for why Kant is important. Okay? And I take a lot of heat on this, right? justifiably so, because there are good arguments to be made that Kant is pro-reason right, in various some respects. But this is an important turning point according to my argument. Now, what I want to do is just point out some dates here. Kant died in 1804. <clears throat> All right. So what's that, 214 years ago now? All right. So I want to jump just kind of a long generation, just to give you a whiff of what has happened in the history of philosophy after Kant, because Kant, uh, everybody has to know Kant and react to Kant since Kant's philosophy. But let's jump to 1843, Kierkegaard, right? If you're interested in existentialism and certain forms of Protestant theology, Kierkegaard, you have to grapple with him, another giant, right, in the pantheon. 40 years later, but what we have is an explicit irrationalism by the time we get to Kierkegaard's chapter. If you want to believe the things that are genuinely meaningful in your life and are going to give you significance, you have to make a leap, as he puts it here, into the absurd. Right? Because the things that really give us meaning in life, right? we can't make sense of them rationally, but we really want to believe them and feel that we need to, so we need to do a leap of faith. Unfortunately, we've got all of these pro-reason philosophers who say we have to be rational, right, and so forth. And so what we need to do then is crucify reason, right? Go on the attack against reason. So we're very deeply anti-enlightenment, right, uh, in this school 40 years later. All right, that's 1840s. Another 40 years, it's not perfect math. What's that, 43 years? All right, Nietzsche. Astoundingly important philosopher for the last 100 years writing, how pitiful, how shadowy and fleeting, how aimless and capricious the human intellect is. Right? So anti-rationalism right, with a vengeance right, 80 years later. Jumping another 40 years, Martin Heidegger, whether you love him or hate him, right, the man was a screaming Nazi after all, right, so I'm going to be a little bit prejudiced. but. Brilliant, brilliant philosopher, right? Uh, you know, I disagree, again, fundamentally with him. He's on my top three list of most important philosophers of the 20th century. 
Most philosophers right, will agree with this. And again, he's talking about here we're trying to do some metaphysics and reason our way to certain conclusions, and we just keep reaching these contradictions. And here's this contradiction that has nagged philosophers for a huge amount of time. And Heidegger's reaction to that then is to say, if this contradiction breaks the sovereignty of reason, then the fate of the rule of logic is also decided. Logic disintegrates in the vortex of a more original questioning. So some issues that we want to grapple with right somehow, logic gets in the way, reason can't wrap its mind around it, so we need to set aside logic, set aside reason, and find some other way to get to that. And the point just is that there's now a long irrationalist tradition of philosophy, very powerful and very prominent, right after Kant, and by now we are getting into the 20th century. All right. Um, those are all what we call continental philosophers. These guys are also continental, uh, but they are of a different school that is typically seen as a pro-reason, pro-science school, and things have been going on in post-enlightenment philosophy also in the 1800s and as we got into the 20th century. But many of the pro-science philosophers are also reaching skeptical, dead-end kinds of conclusions. So I'll just give you some names here. Moritz Schlick, leading logical positivist thinker reaching conclusions about language. Right? Language is not a tool that we use objectively to try to come to understand the world. The rules of language are, in principle, arbitrary. Right? So language is an arbitrary, subjective uh, vehicle that we use. Logic, the scientists are all about logic, right? And logical proof, right? And, and, and building uh, uh, mathematics on, on logical foundations, right? And so forth. Logic, uh, according to Ludwig Wittgenstein, all the propositions of logic say the same thing, right? that is, Nothing. Logic does not tell us anything. Right? Uh, A.J. Ayer, the principles of logic and mathematics are true universally. OK, fine. That sounds very nice right? if we're interested in science and coming to understand the world. We want universal truth. But why are the principles of logic and mathematics true universally? Well, because we never allow them to be anything else. Right? It's a decisional thing. We just allow them to be true. It's not that they are true and we have discovered them. It's a subjectivism that is being reached at this point here. And the point then is logic, language, mathematics, either empty or subjective. And these are the deep truths that leading philosophers are reaching again now by the first decades of the 20th century. So more, right? Rudolf Carnap, metaphysics and value theory, so metaphysics and ethics, two of the big concerns. What's the nature of reality? What is it to live a good life, the traditional philosophy concerns? Well, metaphysics, including all value and normative theory, logical analysis yields a negative result that the alleged statements in this domain are entirely meaningless. Right? Metaphysics is entirely meaningless. Ethics, entirely meaningless. And if it's meaningless, then it's pointless to try to do those things. We should just set them aside. Brian Medlin is now pretty generally accepted, and I think this is, as a survey truth, true by professional philosophers that ultimate ethical principles must be arbitrary. That's 1957, published in one of the leading respected journals, right, of philosophy. And I want to cite the 1950s because this is important, right, as a decade. Right? That by the time we get to the 1950s, just the philosophers are the ones that you would read if you take history of philosophy courses, you become a serious philosopher, or you're just a philosophically minded person who wants to know what's going on. All of them are reaching skeptical, empty, nihilistic conclusions about the nature of philosophy. So. Lyotard, Foucault, Derrida, Rorty. The biographical data becomes important. Brilliant guys. They go to school. Born in 1924, 26, 30, 31. Okay. By the time they get into their 20s and early 30s, which is by the time most people get their doctorates, if they're going to get a doctorate, Lyotard gets his in 58, Foucault a little earlier in 51, Derrida in 55. Rorty in 56. They're being educated and reaching professional status in philosophy in the 1950s. What had they learned? 
from all of the genius philosophers that they had read. Yeah. Skepticism, emptiness, meaningless, and so forth. And the point is going to be that the reason why these guys are cited justifiably as the leading postmodernists is that they are the ones who best recognized where philosophy was in the 1950s and the 1960s and decided what to do about it, what the next steps were going to be. They were the ones who reacted to the failure of philosophy in the middle part of the 20th century and came up with the alternative. And what's the alternative? So this is my first thesis. I'm going to say we've talked a lot about knowledge, right, truth, meaningless, right, and so forth. This claim here is that Kantian epistemology is the ground root, but as things get worked out over the course of the next century and a half, by the time we get to the middle part of the 20th century, postmodern philosophical foundations have been laid. And I've just got this interesting quote from Nietzsche, right, who's kind of on the same page here. If you take Kant seriously and apply it consistently, you will end up with a gnawing, crumbling skepticism. Now, he was projecting, and that's exactly where philosophy got 50 years after his death. Okay. And that's the thesis that I am arguing. So when you are encountering postmodernists, and on one side of their mouth, they are saying, you know, nobody knows anything right for sure. Right? It's all just semantics. Right? There are different interpretive frameworks. You have your narrative. I have my narrative. They have their narrative, and so forth. And it's all just narratives. Well, narratives are just subjective constructions that push various value buttons right, that we have. And we have no objective way to adjudicate the value or increasing betterness of one compared to the other. That's this. Right? And there's a deep philosophical story for why that came to ascendancy in the Western intellectual world when it did. All right. I think that's a good argument, partly because I made it up myself. <laughs> and I know uh, there's a lot of good counter arguments right, that can be made about that. And we were just flying over the territory at 40,000 feet, so to speak. But there's a thesis there. But I do think this argument I've made so far has a problem. Any guesses? It's false. That's, it's false. <laughs> That's not complete. Okay. The problem is going to be politics. Right? And I haven't said much about politics. Right? But we also know when we talk with postmodernism that there is a politics at work there as well. Right? So that has to be integrated into the story right, as well. So the angry young man. Right? This is not just, you know, I'm, your theory of concept formation and linguistic semantics needs some adjustment hicks. Right? Right? It's something more significant right, going on. And we know that politics gets people juiced up. So we have to talk about politics right, a little bit here. Now suppose, though, that we believed, sorry, this thesis was true. Right? That really what postmodernism is about is some really deep people thinking about knowledge and truth and the epistemology and metaphysics and reaching some really skeptical conclusions. You know, I, I guess nobody really does know anything. Maybe it is all just subjective. Right? Maybe we all just do make up things that push our own value buttons and, and so forth. Or we're just culturally determined by the groups. Well, maybe that's true. So maybe I'll just be a skeptic okay. about everything. Right. And that then means that I and everybody else, when we believe things, we're really just making arbitrary subjective commitments to this, that, or the other thing, whatever we want, right? Because that's what subjectivism is all about, bottom line, right? So if that's true, right. what would that mean for politics? Right. All right, so there's, what, maybe 150, a couple hundred people here, right? So suppose we all did a lot of philosophy, and all of us right, came to be screaming subjectivists, right? All right. That's a bit flip really strongly believing that there is no truth, that everything is just subjective, right, whatever, and so forth. I said, all of us then are making our decisions about what we're going to believe in the value parts of our lives, and we're going to include that some political views. Right? So we're all going to make arbitrary, subjective commitments to a certain way of thinking about the world politically. And so we all do that. And then we do the survey. Okay? 
So we just go around the room and say, okay, what, what, what politics did you subjectively commit to, right? And he says, well, I don't know, he's a big strapping guy. He says, I want to be the king, right? I'm, I'm into monarchy, and I think you're looking around, I have a pretty good chance that I could pull it off, okay? <laughs> Form a few strategic alliances, right, and so forth, okay? So, yeah. I don't know, you seem like a very sweet, right, person. You say, I don't know, I think everybody should be nice and get along and share everything right, with everybody. So she doesn't like monarchy, but she's gonna to write to commit, right? And you, somebody says, no, no, I think people should uh, have freedom and uh, rights are absolute, right? And other people are gonna be fascists and, right? I, I think I like the idea of, I don't know, let's all go back to the land and live in tribes, right? Peacefully in harmony with nature. So some kind of tribalism, right, and so on, okay. So we're all just doing our subjective fantasizing. How many different politics will we come up with right, in this room? Right? I don't know. Right? If there's 160 people, then maybe 165, right? because five people right, are indecisive and change their mind right? and so forth. And you're, that's fine, because everything is subjective anyway. Right? OK, good. So what we would expect then, and this is the more serious hypothesis, is if Everything was just about people reaching skeptical, relativistic conclusions about knowledge and truth, that when they turned to value issues and political issues, they would be all over the map politically. You would have people making subjective leaps into all kinds of normative programs and political programs. But, and this is the problem, when you look at the postmodernists, they are not all over the map politically. If you, however you define the political spectrum, far whatever right over here to far whatever right over here, right? if everything was subjective and random, then we would expect a random distribution on the spectrum. But what we find is that all of the postmodernists in the first two generations, without exception, now don't take it on faith for me, but I can give you the list and you can do your own homework. You take the top 10 leading postmodernists and they are all here on the political spectrum. You take the top 20, the top 50, the top 100, the top 200 most cited people in the literature. They are all at the very far left end of the political spectrum. And that's not an accident. Right? That's not a random distribution. So that's the problem. Why is it then that we find a very powerful contingent of thinkers who subscribe to far left politics now adopting postmodern, skeptical, relativistic, subjectivistic epistemology. What's going on there? All right. Go back to biography. There's the big four. I'm using them as representative. Lyotard, if you add his politics, by the time he's in the 50s, right, he's a young man, and like most young people, we get into politics and we get passionate, right, about our politics. He committed to far left version of neo-Marxist politics. Foucault joined the French Communist Party, uh, was with them for a few years, broke with them, but then in the 60s became a kind of Maoist, right, another kind of communism. Jacques Derrida, Politics did not join the French Communist Party, almost, right? but he did hang around in those circles, publish in those journals, and as we saw in the quotation earlier, said his entire agenda was in a certain spirit of Marxism. Richard Rorty is an American. These three are French. Right? Communist Party, never that strong right, in the United States right, for various reasons, but on the American political landscape, Rorty is a strong social democrat and about as far left as you can go uh, on the American political landscape. And the same thing holds for Stanley Fish and the others as you go through the list, all on the very far left part of the spectrum. So what we then have is a number of individuals, very smart, committed to far left politics, but in the 1950s in a very skeptical philosophical world. Now, the politics matters in another way because, all right, there's Uncle Carl. I swear to you this, my introductory microeconomics professor looked exactly like that guy. 
And it was really disconcerting because I was reading a lot of Marx right at the time. This guy was actually kind of conservative, right? and so it was uh, a little cognitive dissonance here. So what does far left, especially Marxist philosophy, mean? Of course, lots of things that we said, so I'm just going to give you a thumbnail thing here, but here's a few things. Four claims of classical socialism Marxist version. Right? Two of them are going to be moral claims. If you compare capitalism to socialism, which one is morally superior and which one is morally inferior? Right? So there's the moral agenda. And Marx, as we know, right, thought economics was the mother science, the foundation right, of everything that is built upon it, foundational economic claims about the economic productivity of capitalism compared to socialism. And this is worked out by Marx and his colleague Engels primarily and others in the middle part of the 1800s. Right? Communist Manifesto is published in 1848. Right? So hold that date in your mind. So, First, the moral claims. Capitalism is exploitative. You have rich people, you have poor people. The rich people have the power. They use their power to keep the poor people down and to extract right, wealth from them. It's competitive, it's uh, imperialistic, and so the capitalist profit motive brings out the worst in people, and it's a dog-eat-dog -dog struggle, right, and so forth. Socialism, then, is moral because it rejects the impetus of capitalism, the competition, the class society basis instead. It's committed to humanity, it's committed to peace, everybody is going to share, and we're going to try to keep people equal. All right, so, moral claim. Capitalism uh, seems to be doing all right and is more productive than feudalism was, right? But ultimately, it's going to be less productive than socialism, the Marxists, right, are claiming, right? Because it's got these internal contradictions that are going to work its, their way out, and as a result of that, it's not going to be able to keep its act together. The poor get poorer, the rich get richer. This causes internal conflict right, within the advanced capitalist societies, and the whole thing then will collapse in revolution. Socialists by economies, by contrast, they will be more prosperous because people are going to be working with each other instead of against each other. And at least in the early stages, we're going to have a dictatorship of the proletariat, but the dictatorship will be wise, benevolent leaders who are able to assess the economy as a whole and make proper allocations of resources and distribute things right appropriately. And so we will be much more right productive. So a pair of moral claims and a pair of economic claims, classical Marxist socialism. Now, the other thing I want to add to this is that Marxism labels itself as scientific socialism. Right? So it's socialism, but we're not just abstract dreamers. We are socialists who think. We have studied the way the world works. The iron laws of economics right, are going to work out. Human nature, we have the right theory of it. This theory yields definite predictions about the way the world is going to go, and we are going to stand on those predictions. We are scientific about this. This is not utopia, it's reality. So, another death by PowerPoint chart, right? but let me talk you through it. Marxism is a class analysis, right? So let's take the slogan, the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. We all know that one, but we'll tease it out. What does that mean when we actually apply it to a social scientific understanding of the way capitalist society works? Well, we say, we have three classes. We have the working class, the proletariat. We have a middle class, because there had been a rising middle class, and we have the upper class. The working class, they're weak, they're poor, right? they don't have much status. The middle class, they're comfortable, but they're unstable. And the upper class are the powerful and the rich people. Okay? So that's where they are initially. Initially, what's going on then in capitalist societies is, of course, the poor are being exploited. The wealth is being extracted from them. There are so many of them, wages are pushed down. Capitalists get to make all of the rules. They control the government so they can extract as much wealth as they want. And so these guys are exploited, and it's very hard for them to get out of their condition, if not right, impossible. And so they're basically going to, uh, uh, as Marxism predicts, become more and more people in the population. Right? So the prediction then is going to be, as capitalism advances, more and more people will be forced into poverty right, as a result of the capitalist dynamic. The middle class, right, they're unstable because the logical capitalist competition right, says there's winners and there's losers, and we're all competing with each other. Some people in the middle class will succeed in clawing their way up to the rich class, but the most of them are going to at some point make a mistake, right, or they're going to be outcompeted, and they'll be forced down into the proletariat. 
So the claim of classical Marxism is that the middle class really has no future. It's going to be squeezed out. Right? And that then predicts population should asymptotically approach zero right, uh, for the future. And the rich right, start off. They're exploiting and ruthless. They've got all the power. But of course, they're all competing with each other. right? Because if you're a millionaire, you want to be a 100 millionaire. Then you want to be a billionaire. And if you're a Marxist, you believe that's zero-sum competition. And so the logic then is to say fewer and fewer rich people will succeed at this ruthless competition. And they will slowly amass all of the wealth in their own hands. And then all of the other former semi-rich people will be forced down right, the chain of plan. So we have very then three social science predictions that we make. Right? Population of the poverty, people in poverty will go up dramatically under capitalism. The middle class will shrink to nothingness, and the rich class, the bourgeoisie, will also shrink although to a very small number. Now, the problem then is going to be, and I'm going to say this is a problem, that even in Marx's lifetime, and certainly in the succeeding generations right, of Marxists, by the time we get to 1900, right, 1920, right, and so forth, and we march our way through, is that all three of those predictions failed. It's not just that they failed by a little bit, right, or that the data was mixed, but that the, all of the data is showing that the exact opposite right, is coming to pass. If you look at poverty rates under the more capitalistic nations, rather than more people living in poverty, po poverty rates are going down. They're going down significantly. That's an opposite. The middle class is supposed to be becoming smaller and smaller. Instead, what is happening is it's getting bigger and significantly bigger. The number of people who are rich is supposed to be getting smaller and smaller, but the problem is the number of rich people is getting more and more. Right? Damn it, there's just more and more millionaires, right? And then billionaires, right, and so forth. Now this is a problem because if you think of Marxism as social science, social science stands on its predictions as measured against the data. And by every measure, Marxist social science failed to fit the data. In fact, the data was the exact opposite. And this caused a crisis, not only you know, by people who were not sympathetic to Marxism, say, ha, 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 you Marxists got it all wrong, but a crisis within Marxism. And what you find when you read the Marxists of each succeeding generation is they are aware of the data. We predicted this, but now the data says that. What do we do? And of course, we need to start tweaking the theory right in various ways, but this is a problem. And as the generations go on and the predictions get worse and worse, right, the problem gets more and more. Now, I want to say that the crisis reached a head again by the time we get to the 1950s. And the reason for that is important, partly because if you look at the first half of the 20th century, right, the Marxists had said World War I. Right, the Marxist theory of World War I is it's all the capitalist countries getting together and going to war over resources. And what's going to happen is the capitalist countries will basically kill each other off or weaken each other, and that will provide a space for the communist revolution of some sort right, to fill the vacuum. That didn't happen. But good news, depression, right? The Great Depression happened. Marxist theory says, right, this is the final death throes of capitalism, stock market excesses, capitalists getting greedy, et cetera, et cetera. Capitalism is over and out of the economic collapse, right, the proletariat will get their act together and we will have revolution. That didn't happen. World War II, well, this is one that's a little bit more complicated because we've got the communist nations fighting the fascist nations, fighting the liberal democratic nations. But the theory was going to be that the fascists and the liberal capitalists would weaken each other. And then communists, if they bided their time and thought strategically, by the time right, one killed the other, the remaining one would be weakened and we would be able to kill them. And then communist revolution of some sort right, once again. By the time you get to the 1950s, though, it's clear that's not going to happen. Because what's happening in the 1950s? Well, fascism is gone. But it's probably coming back, unfortunately. Right? But, but it's gone. Right? And we do then have the familiar Cold War contours right, of the Soviet Union versus the left uh, or the liberal democratic nations right in the West. But the liberal capitalist nations have recovered from World War I, from the Depression, from World War II. And things are pretty good right, if you start looking at what's going on. 
The poor in the 1950s in the capitalist countries, right? They're all buying cars and television sets, right? And the interstate has been built, so they're taking all these trips, right? And international flight is increasingly available to everybody. Everybody's enjoying all of these movies, right? And eating better, and people are getting taller, et cetera, et cetera. So by the time we get to the 1950s, if you are on the very far left and sympathetic to Marxism, it's not looking good, right, in terms of the data. So it gets worse. We've had 100 years of waiting for the revolution. It hasn't happened. Capitalists are doing better and better, it seems. But what about those moral claims? Capitalism is inhumane. Well, of course, you know, there's lots of things we can complain about, how Canadians have treated each other, right? and how Americans have treated each other, and human rights issues, right, and so forth. In the grand scheme of things, those are important, but relatively light by historical standards. By and large, you've got a pretty good chance of putting together a pretty good life if you're living in one of those countries. But on the other side, right, two crushing blows happened in 1956. Right? And these were crushing blows to Western Marxists especially. Because for a generation, Western Marxists had thought, despite the predictions about the economic modeling right and so forth, at least we have the Soviet Union. And the Soviet Union is a beacon of our humane moral future. It's a communist revolution that succeeded. And Stalin, Papa Joe, is at the helm with the power to do what is necessary to usher the Soviet Union and therefore eventually the rest of the world in the right direction. An almost messianic right, fervor about what was going on in the Soviet Union. Right. Any number of fellow travelers go over there. They take the tours. They come back, write glowing right, reports. 1956, right, Stalin has died. Khrushchev has consolidated power. And he announces in a speech that all of those stories about genocide, about the asylums, about the torture, about Siberia were true. It wasn't just CIA propaganda. It was all right. Tens of millions right, of people tortured, starved, exterminated right, under what was supposed to be the humane social system that ever existed. How is this possible? 1956, also in Hungary, one of the satellite states, right, now behind the Iron Curtain. Things aren't going very well economically. Right? Students in university classes are chafing at having to take only Communist Party propaganda right in their courses. Right? They want a more liberal curriculum. They want to have jobs when they get out. Workers are hungry. Right? And so there are protests that are starting, peaceful protests. Well, we know socialist governments care about their people. They care about the workers. They care about the students. The reaction of the Hungarian government was to call up Moscow, say we got big problems here. Moscow sent in the troops, sent in the tanks, and protesters are shot. The ringleaders are dragged off to prison. They are tortured, forced to give up their allies, who are then arrested and tortured. And tanks are sent into the protesters and ride over people. And Western technology, for the first time, this is shown on international television. Everybody sees it. It's not just CIA propaganda again. How is this possible? This is a crisis of faith in the 1950s. So the old left, that is to say the Marxist left, is in trouble. What are we going to do? And what do you do if you are a young person in your late 20s and early 30s, strongly committed to your politics, and you're really, really smart. Okay. Well, you re-strategize. And so one of the things that we do know that happened is this is exactly when the new left started. So we have a new left, a new agenda, right, and so forth. And the point is going to be that that agenda right, is being set by the strategists, and the strategists are the most philosophically minded of them 
and we know who those people are going to be. So this is the second thesis. That is to say that by the time you get to the 1950s, what has happened is, yes, philosophy is at a very skeptical place, epistemologically. But at the same time, people on the far left are going through a crisis about what we are supposed to do now that our youthful dreams in the classical Marxist ideal have failed. And even all kinds of neo-Marxism have been tried, those have failed. And the practical results in the Soviet Union and other places as tried have failed. We need to do some serious thinking. Now, I've used the word faith. And I want to uh, say that there is exactly a parallel here. Because if we think <clears throat> about the kinds of uses of faith that we're more familiar with, what happens if you're an intelligent young person and you believe a certain religious worldview? Typically, you come to believe that it's true, it explains a lot of things, but it also has a strong normative component. You believe that it is moral and decent, and that it's the hope for humanity that your religious vision come to prevail more. But then you start to grow up, and you start to realize that there are lots of smart people who believe very different things right about religion. You start to have arguments with them, and sometimes they've got really good arguments. And you find yourself questioning on the basis of the evidence and the data, whether your religious views right or true. Yeah. And sometimes you reach the conclusion that, you know, I don't actually think the arguments for my religion are, are that good. A lot of holes have been poked in them. They can't be true. And these various alternative religions, including non-religions, the arguments for them are pretty compelling. So we have a crisis right, of faith that, of course, we know millions of people go through. And to put it in polarized terms, it's, am I going to go with what seems to be the best arguments, the best logic, the best evidence, to go with my reason? Or am I going to go with what I really want to be true, which is to say, this religious view that has formed part of my identity and my understanding of what is beautifully and nobly possible for human beings? And what choice do I make? And when it's that polarized, you really have two choices. One choice is to say, you know, the most important thing is the facts, the truth. And I have to go with the logic. I have to go with the evidence. And that means, as hard as it might be for me emotionally, I have to abandon the religion of my youth. I have to live without that religion, adopt some other more rational religion, or possibly live without religion at all. because objectivity, and reasoning matter. And some people do it down that road. But the other option then is to say, you know, I'm going to believe what I want to believe. There's no way I can give up this beautiful, deep part of my identity. And that means that I have to find some way to get rid of the logic, the evidence, and the commitment to reason. That I'm going to elevate a subjective commitment to something I want to be true over reason. And we do know in the history then of religion that there are many religious strategists who take that route. Limit reason, crucify reason, set aside reason in order to rejuvenate personal faith commitment. Now that exact same Psychology carries over to politics. And that's the claim I'm making here about the 1950s socialists. The smart ones recognized that the arguments for socialism had been destroyed. Mises, Hayek, and the others, and all of the empirical data, right, that was out there. There was no way to give a rational explication for the economic superiority of socialism right, over capitalism. And the data shows that the socialist nations have been brutal in practice. And that by and large, whatever our gripes are about the West, things are pretty good, morally speaking. But if you're a committed socialist, you're at a crisis at this point because you believe that capitalism is evil and socialism is moral. But the logic says the opposite. Do you go with what you want to believe, your socialist ideal, or do you go with the logic? 
And we do know, again, some people make the different choices. Some people say, okay, I need to modify my socialism, abandon socialism, and move toward some sort of liberal democratic understanding. But a lot of people double down and say, I am going to find a more sophisticated way to bracket reason, bracket the evidence, bracket the idea that on politics, reason, evidence, and logic is fundamental. And that's the postmodern move right there. Another colleague at Duke University, Frederick Jamerson, right, a Marxist theorist, right, at exactly this juncture says, yes, we are aware of Marxism's and neo-Marxism history. We are aware of how things have gone right in the West. And we do know it is evidence versus political commitment. And he's making his point clear. Everything in the last analysis is politics. Your political commitments are fundamental. Everything will be shaped to fit the political commitments. All right. So the Enlightenment right, versus postmodernism, right, that's the battle we're fighting right now. These guys were young in the 50s, became mature in the 1960s, leading their professions, grand old men in the 70s and 1980s. Right? Uh, trained any number right, of PhD students who then themselves went on to be professors in the humanities right, in the early the 90s, early 2000s, and our generation, and so forth. Extraordinarily successful for the power of their political strategy and their ability to marshal the philosophical and epistemological arguments to support them. Now, that's where we are. So the battle is uh, joined. But I want to uh, now turn in my concluding minutes here and be critical right, of postmodernism. There are literally dozens of important philosophical issues that I'm not going to be able to talk about, obviously. That all of them need to be engaged. There are good arguments for skepticism and good against. Right? And so all of those issues that have led philosophers down varying paths have to be engaged. So I don't want to undermine the importance of any of those. But there are some things that we can say about the postmodern project, the postmodern claims, and about its assessment of the Enlightenment, especially. So, one thing that we are aware of right, is this issue that postmodernists are, as a movement, right, not logically consistent. Right? And there's a certain amount of traction and importance to pointing out the logical contradictions right, that are made in postmodern. So on the one hand, if we say right, that all truth is relative, right, that is an epistemological claim right, that comes out of postmodernism. But at the same time, postmodernists will tell you that in some sense, their way of looking at things is the right way of looking at things. Right? That the other narratives need to be set aside, bracketed. Right? So when we start talking about what gets into the curriculum, for example, the standard postmodern claim is not that there are all these other traditions, right? and they're all relative, and therefore they're all equal, and so we should teach them all. The agenda is, no, the postmodern one is the right way, and we're exerting all of our efforts to get rid of all of these other books that do not fit our postmodern canon. That's a contradiction, and it's worth calling them on it. If we believe strongly relativistically that all cultures are equally deserving of respect because there is no objective stance from which we can evaluate them, there is a big question why it is that Western culture is always singled out as uniquely bad and evil and worthy of condemnation. That's a contradiction, and it's worth calling out right, that one. If we believe values are really subjective, right, then that sits very uneasily right, with the rhetoric that suggests racism really is evil. And I think that's true, right? but that's a truth claim. Right? Sexism really is evil, right? but you can't have it both ways. Technology is really bad and destructive, right? but it's really unfair. Some people have so much technology while others are going without. <laughs> we hear both of those right, on a regular basis. One implication of deep subjectivism or relativism is a kind of tolerance. right? If I don't know the truth and you don't know the truth and all we have is our own subjective narratives right, and so forth, well, Live and let live, you do your thing, we should just be tolerant. Right? 
Dominance is bad, right? The whole exploitation thing. Rich versus weak, that's just, that's just wrong. Men subjugating women, right? Value judgments. But what we find, of course, is when postmodernists do assume positions of power in the classroom, in university administration, in other cultural institutions, very authoritarian forms of political correctness are immediately put into place. Not tolerance, not eschewing the use of dominance and power. Another contradiction worth calling. Racism, right, sexism, and poverty, right. race, class, and gender, those are the big three right, in terms of analysis. But when we look at the uh, arguments here, the claim, of course, theoretically, is that liberal capitalist West is deeply racist. Right? But we do know, again, it's a matter of historical record. Slavery was first challenged as morally repugnant in Western nations and in nations that adopted the philosophy of the Enlightenment. And it's only been in places where those Enlightenment ideals have made inroads around the world that racist ideas have been put on the defensive. The West is deeply sexist, right? But then if we look at the status of Western women, right, over the course of the last 200 centuries, not that all social problems have been solved here, but it is a very right, progressive story. Western capitalists are cruel to the poor. Well, I'll tell you, if you want to be poor, you want to be poor in Canada, right? <laughs> All right. Or the United States, right, and so on, All right, for various reasons. All right, now those are just uh, pot shots, right, so to speak. Those are argument starters, right? The clever postmodernists, of course, have thought about these things. Uh, they will have some responses, but these are useful sallies. But I wanted now do an unpostmodern thing and actually look at some data, right? Data, facts, logical interpretations, mathematics, statistics, right? Et cetera, et cetera. If you're an enlightenment guy, you think those matter, right? Uh, and I think we should be using them against the postmoderns. The dim ruins of the enlightenment, the failure of the enlightenment project. Well, let's look at some data. Are we interested in poverty? All right, this is a beautiful website. Uh, I wish I had this when I was a student, right? But uh, it's a Gapminder, it's a Swedish site. I invite you to go to Gapminder. You can do beautiful things with the data playing around with it. But this is a chart. This is the world in 1812, the number is superimposed here. What we have on the vertical axis is life expectancy in years. Right? So it starts at 20, 25, 30, right? And it goes on up to 85 for sneaky reasons that we'll reveal in a few seconds here. Along the bottom here, we have uh, income measures. We have both GDP, gross domestic product, and then we also have purchasing power parity and adjustment for inflation. So we want to keep these numbers across uh, both what you earn and what you can buy with what you earn, and we want to compare different nations with each other. Each of these circles is a nation right, in the world. So there's actually 180-something circles there. They are big circles, big population, small circle, small population, and they're also color-coded for what part of the world you are in. So all of these kind of, I don't know, pumpkin-colored ones, those are European nations. This uh, yellow one here, that's the United States, right, in um, uh, 1812. That one right there, that's Canada right, in 1812. The dark blue nations are sub-Saharan African nations. The big blue, uh, the, and the, or rather the light blue, one of them very big, those are the uh, uh, South Asian nations, right, and so forth. Uh, okay, so point then is, I'll give you some numbers here. That's 400, that's 1,000, this is 2,000, 4,000. This is also a logarithmic scale, it's doubling for each right, unit of, uh, of territory here as we go, go along. But what this then is to say is if you go to 1812, right, all of the countries, the country that has the highest life expectancy in the world, it's about 42. And it's uh, GDP about 3,800. That's the richest country in the world in 1812. Guess which one it is? That's England, all right? So this is England, right, uh, about 50 years after the Industrial Revolution had started, right? Uh, the first nation of the Enlightenment, and it's already breaking away right from the pack. If you go to 1712, England is right down around here. Uh, that's the United States, right? This is France, right? This is uh, Germany, right? And these are Western European nations. And then Canada's lagging a little bit right behind. Okay. Um, 
Jump ahead 100 years. We'll go to 1912. Okay, so we have 1812, 1912. Right, one century. All right, that, again, is the United States, but notice how much bigger it has gotten. Right, population is increasing. Right, income, right, the United States income was down around here, $2,200 or so. Now it is about 8,000. Right, uh, there's Canada, right, keeping company. Uh, these are all Western European nations. These are two East Asian nations that have opened themselves up to trade with the West right, in the previous generation. A lot of other countries are all still stacking around. But notice what we have is most of Europe and North America and two East Asian nations have significantly right, improved. Life expectancy, we've now got some nations in the 50s, right, flirting with 60 right at that point. All right, one more 100 years, we'll go to 2012, basically our generation. That's what happened in the last century. Okay. So uh, the United States, right, even bigger. Canada's in there. Uh, Japan, right, Singapore, Hong Kong, all of the Western European nations. These are now the Eastern European nations. Right? This is now after the fall of Soviet Union, one generation. This is where the log scale becomes important because you know, if you take uh, uh, these Eastern European nations here, Right, that's about $18,000 per person. Standard Western European nations, right, it's in the 30s, so it's more than double. Right? Uh, these are the two North American nations. These are the Latin American nations. Right? I believe this one is Mexico. Right? So Mexico is around 15,000, right? uh, despite proximity to Arizona. If you're in Arizona, right, you're about 50,000, so the powder makes a big difference there as well. But look at the sub-Saharan nations, all of them. Right? All of them were down here. Uh, I don't know what parts of the world you travel to. I always tell my students to go to Mexico, and often they do for spring break and so forth. They all come back and say, you know, the poverty in Mexico, I just can't believe how awful it was. It was just horrible. Right? It really is horrible, right, by American standards and by Canadian standards. But Yep, there's the, yep, the Mexicans are right there. Right? By historical standards, that's not bad. Okay? Now, of course, if you're Mexican, right, and you go to some of these sub-Saharan African nations, right, right, it's pretty grim. But this is the striking point I want us to get to. Right? These are all three of the charts here. Every single country in the world, right, 200 years ago was right down there. That is to say, all of the countries in the world were in this lower left quadrant. Right? There's nobody there anymore. Life expectancies have doubled even in the poorest nations of the world. Income has, uh, in some cases, doubled, tripled, quadrupled, right, and so forth, in a space of 200 years. Right? So when someone says what happened in the Enlightenment was a mistake, right, philosophically and institutionally, right, there's some data that speaks to that. Right? Because that looks like a success story to me. If you think living long and wealthy is a good thing, and I do. So are you interested in racism and sexism? Of course we are, yes. This is basically the 20th century story about women's education in North America, uh, heavily skewed by American data. So this, each of these lines is a degree. So bachelor's degree, master's degree, doctoral degree, law degrees, medical degrees, right? Early part of the 20th century and part of the 20th century. The trend lines are all up, right? significantly. Uh, in fact, for bachelor's degrees and master's degrees, it's now 60 to 70 percent of all of them are right, women. Right? It's the men who are having more troubles right? uh, getting those degrees right and so forth. And that looks like right, success to me, and that's in the Enlightenment right, touched nations. Uh, racism, sex, sorry, racism, right, uh, and so forth. This is the story, right? Um, Slaves or serfs in the world in 1750, by this measure, about 76% of the world's population was either a serf or a slave, right? At that time, enlightenment is just starting its push to say there's something morally repugnant about slavery. Let's do something about that. And this is the story, right? Until now we get to our generation and we still have slavery and serfdom right in the world, but a very small minority of the population, and we're still going after that. That looks like a success to me. 
This is a survey published in 2013. You can get this at Washington Post, uh, measuring racial tolerance. Right? One of the questions they ask is, how comfortable are you living with someone in your neighborhood who's of a different race right, or a neighborhood? And so there's dozens of questions that mine that territory. And what we find is in uh, all of the blue, right, those are the nations where people are fine with it. The vast majority of people, you find fewer than 5% of the population saying, no, I actually have a problem living with someone whose skin is not my color. Right? Other parts of the world, right, the, Data is, of course, much more mixed and much more the other way. But again, it's not accidental right, that the nations that are the most blue right, are the ones that are the most touched by Enlightenment philosophy. And that looks like a success to me. So I'm going to assert there's a fact right, that the progress right, has been real. But I'm highlighting the philosophically charged terms because I said fact. Right? And I said progress. And I said real. Okay. And the philosophical debate right, is, is joined. Okay. Now, of course, all of this has huge implications for the culture wars. Right? If you don't believe in facts, you don't believe in progress, you believe in the opposite of that, you don't believe there is a real biological or physical reality that we are ultimately responsive to. If you think everything is about power and social construction, you will have a very right, different agenda. And that's the one we're dealing with right, right now. Uh, and my argument is, well, you know, if your agenda, whatever your agenda is, the facts and the logic are against you, and I think they are against postmodernism, you should expect some non-factual, factual, non-logical, non-civil, right, non-liberal arts education responses to it. You will find a very negative, hostile, uncivil, warlike response, and that's what we're seeing manifested in what I now think of as third generation postmodernism. And that's what we're dealing with right now. All right, so uh, that's my book. Uh, some of the theses there. I'll stop at this point, And uh, my hosts will let me know how much time I have to field questions. So please have at it. You guys get to go first. Nice. Nice. Uh, we have about half an hour. If they run out, then we'll ask some other people to come up and we'll ask questions. Yeah, go ahead. Do you want to ask questions? You guys are left or right. <laughs> So left-right spectrum is garbage. <laughs> so the way that they're used now is, is more or less accidental packagings of, uh, of people. So there's this package. So in the United States, you're liberal or you're conservative. And there's not necessarily any internal coherency between all of the elements right of the package. Uh, and we just call them left and right for, for various reasons. And the pretense then is that it's just a, a kind of one dimension right, along which we can measure. And that's exactly right, the problem. So uh, when you start to flesh things out, right, we do know there are tribalisms, and there are feudalisms, and there are fascisms, and there are socialisms, and there are libertarianisms, and classical liberalisms, and so forth. There's no way to put them all on one spectrum right, from, from left to right. So I'm actually surprised that your son is still getting that, because right? I can remember having the exact same question right, when I was a freshman in, uh, right, in university. So the idea was that you know, Hitler is at the far right, Right? And you know, Stalin is at the far left. And so then, I don't know, where, where do you put uh, to Thomas Jefferson? Right? Is he like 
a compromise right, between Hitler and, yeah, that's like, so if we're, if we're supposed to say on this, it doesn't make any sense, right? Or if you kick it up to the theoreticians, right? So we've got, you know, uh, Giovanni Gentili, right, one of the, the philosophers of fascism, right? And then we've got Karl Marx, well, where do you put John Stuart Mill? You know, it's not that he's borrowing this from the communists and this from the fascists, right? In some sort of uh, packaging, so it's inappropriate. So I think uh, you know, part way through your question, you said the right thing is to say, well, what is the dimension, right, that we're trying to measure? And serious political scientists will then start to right, take up that point. So then you say, for example, you have, who do you think the polity is? Right? Do you think the polity is comprised of a number of individuals, and the polity is trying to serve those individuals, or do you think of the polity as a collective? And then what we're interested in is what's good for the whole, and the assumption that somehow the society as a whole should be coming together. So that then would be to say you are having one aspect of your political spectrum should be individualism to collectivism. But that's not the only important political question. Another important question is how much power and authority do we think a government should have? And so another one is to say, well, governments should be limited to some very clearly defined functions constitutionally uh, prohibited from going beyond those functions versus other gov uh, kinds of politics that say we think government should be vested with large amounts of power, large or right amounts of authority. So then you have a different spectrum that says you know, strong authoritarianism to limited government minimalism at the other spectrum. And you keep going through. And so what you will then end up with is a multi-dimensional uh, analysis. And when I've done this in my semi-professional way, I think there are five important dimensions here. And you can't just say it's left and right. It's fine to say, I've defined this dimension. This is what we are measuring. And you can then metaphorically say, I'm on the left or the right here. But that has to come after some very serious work. Thanks. I'll go over to this side for the next question. So earlier today, you're all aware that a protester entered the venue, but he didn't have permission. He did not have a ticket, so he couldn't stay. Um, but at the Free Speech Club, we like to allow people to have their say, but they just have to follow the rules. And so I've taken down a question from him, okay. and it's very simple. Uh, it's just, was Foucault a socialist? Oh, uh, I think broadly speaking, yes. Uh, evidence would be the fact that he joined the French Communist Party in the 1950s. That's one datum. <laughs> uh, he was not a hardcore Stalinist, and the reason why he broke was that by the time he got to the, uh, the early 1950s, it was very clear that the French Communist Party was just taking marching orders from Moscow, uh, and Foucault did have enough of, a, of an anarchist, anti-authoritarian streak that he couldn't stomach it right, at a certain point. And he is one of the ones who reflected on the fact that the, uh, the socialist nations, all of the ones that were claiming inspiration from Marx, were turning out to be very brutal right, in their practice. And so he was enough right, of a person to say, this is not what I want. And so he backed away from it. But then at the same time, you know, uh, 15 years later, he's wildly enthusiastic right, about what's going on in, uh, in, uh, in, in China right, under Mao. Right? You know, we know now that Mao is slaughtering tens of millions of people but Foucault was out there waving the, the Maoist banner. Right? So I think that counts as a datum right, for being a, a socialist. Uh, he always described himself as a, as, a, as a man of the left, and in French intellectual circles, that means right, a kind of socialist. So uh, I know that there are uh, other elements right, of, so, of Foucault, and he did evolve right, over time. So I think at points you could say he was less socialist or more socialist, but that's the territory he was working in. For most of his career. Hi. Hey, uh, so I've got a two-parter question. Um, Are two-parters legal? Uh, yeah, I'll, be, I'll be very, very brief. Okay. Um, so I noticed uh, in some of the, more, the common moral positions that you said postmodernists take, it seems like there's a lot of overlap there between um, uh, this, those sort of positions and say Nietzsche and slave morality. Uh, so, so that's question number one. Uh, what do you think about that? And question number two. Question number two. Um, could Nietzsche be regarded as some kind of post postmodernist, perhaps? Yeah. All right. So the Nietzsche story. Yeah. And I'll get your book on Nietzsche. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I wrote a book on Nietzsche and the Nazis because uh, Nietzsche had an influence on an enormous right, range of uh, people in the 20th century, all over the political map, and so on. 
But uh, yeah, the Nazis did see him as one of their forerunners, and the extent to which that was legitimate by them or not is, is the subject of that book. But yes, one of the things that Nietzsche is famous for is his account of master morality and slave morality. And ultimately, he was a power politician. He didn't believe in truth. Uh, and so this is partly why the postmoderns see him as a forerunner. Right? So everything is perspectival, and uh, uh, science is, a, is a, a psychological projection right, on a messy reality, right, and so on. So the postmodernists, to some extent, do legitimately see Nietzsche as a forerunner, uh, often filtered through Heidegger, right, who also was a deeply read in, in Nietzsche. The idea is that ultimately it's, uh, it's power. Power works through us and constitutes us, but there are different locuses of power captured in different social groups. And so we have to understand things sociologically in terms of power struggles, and some dominate and some don't, and so on. So all of that is very Nietzschean. To go back to the, uh, the Foucault question, uh, at one point, right, uh, Foucault said of himself, you know, you get right down to it, I'm just basically a Nietzschean. And I just uh, and I tried to read things right through, uh, through Nietzschean texts. So, so that's the positive claim that says Nietzsche to the postmodernists uh, uh, legitimate uh, story that can be told. Right? But at the same time, this is the first question that you raise. So I'm taking them in reverse order. There is right, an obvious way in which Nietzsche would be disgusted right, with postmodernism. Because one of the things that we find in postmodernism is this idea of victimization, right? and that when you are you know, the strong group versus weak group, uh, well, if you really believe it's strong versus weak, you do have a value choice to make. Right? Am I going to be on the side of the strong? And I just say, you know, it is a dog-eat-dog -dog world, and uh, I'm just not going to be lunch. Right? I'm going to be one of the, the ones that eat lunch. Right? That means I have to be tough and willing to dominate right, and so forth. Or am I going to say, yeah, the world is dog-eat-dog, -dog, but I really feel sad or you know, the, the runts of the litter. Right? And you know, I, I wish that they had more uh, safety in the world. Right? And so all of us runts get together, and uh, you know, we herd together for safety right, against the big bad ones and form alliances and so forth. Now that's metaphorical, right? but we do have, right, literally, right, in postmodernism, uh, systematic identification with any group that has a victim claim. And the victim claim is always valorized, right? And your, the mark of your being a moral person is your identification, right, with the group. And uh, one of the political tactics or social tactics that you use to advance is you play up your victim status, right, because that then leads you to various kinds of great goodies, right, and so forth. So uh, Nietzsche, though, of course, himself is on the other side of that divide. He did say the world is power, strong versus weak. But uh, his view was uh, uh, that if we are going to advance the human species, it's not going to be the weaklings that get us there, right? It is going to be the strong, the powerful, who have an agenda and who are willing to dominate other people, even to the point of slavery, right? He was, he was an advocate of slavery to make people right, uh, use their energy and use their power for my own agenda, and then that's going to enable me to do something great. So. Nietzsche, uh, I think in his metaphysic and epistemology, right, is very much uh, what the postmoderns are drawing upon. In his value theory uh, and his politics, he is anti-postmodern. I'll go back over here. Thank you for your lecture. It was uh, really interesting. Um, two kind of questions. My first question that I came prior to this uh, event wanting to ask about, and I think I still can ask after hearing it, has to do with the law. And recently in Canada, there was a, a decision made where a person was found not guilty of a crime they were accused of. And then uh, I was reading later an analysis of done of that, sort of an analysis, from a Marxist uh, piece of writing, where they talked about the person's uh, fear in the situation that they were in as being perceived, and that that's why they uh, did the act that they did, which they were accused of being a crime. And so, so I'm I wondering guess. about the language, you talked about linguistics and yeah. language, so that's 
my main question it has to do with the law and okay, what's happening I, with that. Because presumed I, innocence is what I'm talking about. Ah, okay. Or something else, which is uh, what people want rather than looking at presumed innocence. Right. And my second comment, more than anything, has to do with what you were talking about this evening. I was wondering where the work of uh, J.S. Bach would fit into the um, concept of reason and all that. Because to me it seems very... You want know, Sebastian Bach Baroque music? Yeah. Like, oh, okay. Yeah, like I wouldn't be able to do without it if it didn't exist. <laughs> so, <laughs> is it something to do with the age of reason or with reason coming as a concept? Right. Okay. That's a very interesting question because one of the things that's uh, interesting in the development of music is uh, you know, all the data that shows that uh, having a mathematical mind and able to uh, have large-scale abstract structures and to sustain that over time is essential right, to the development of great composing. So we might then float a hypothesis right, historically that large-scale right, musical pieces that are integrated and mathematically intricate can only happen in a culture that has widespread great respect for reasoning and uh, some facility with mathematical. Now, that's just a hypothesis, and I would just put it up there for investigation. But then you know, the, the timing of the great explosions of certain kinds of music right in the West would fit, and they would track on to the development of early Enlightenment thinking. Now, your first question, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not sure I'm going to get it quite right, but it's a question about law, presumption of innocence. Someone did something, but their explanation for why they did that was their, 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 their feelings in response to how they thought someone else was perceiving them. Am I? No. Okay, go ahead. I just, I guess I, I could probably get the Isn't it the question about presumption of innocence, the or is it about the perception? The person is the Saskatchewan who was accused of murder of a youth, and then he was found not guilty. And so then afterwards, everyone uh, was uh, objecting to the decision that he was not guilty. And, I would only think that they must have thought that he is guilty because they claimed there was no justice. But my opinion is that if there's no evidence to prove the person guilty, then you would be unjust to find them guilty. Okay. And the other thing being um, the critique that I read of the, of the outcome from these Marxists was that his fear that someone was going to harm him was perceived. Mm. Okay. Rather I'm, than that yeah, he actually me, was uh, afraid of something that was real, that person was threatening him. All right, yeah, let me, uh, tell you, I don't know the particulars of the, the case in Saskatchewan, so I, I won't be able to give a, an answer to that part of it. But one of the things that was part of your question was this question of presumption of innocence. And another part was the question, what do we make of the status of evidence if it is first-person reports of a person's feelings in contrast to evidence that is objectively verifiable by any number of parties? And I would say, yeah, absolutely. Uh, if your epistemology crumbles, right, uh, then all of those procedural issues about what counts as legitimate evidence in a court of law are going to change. They're going to crumble right and go away. And courtrooms ultimately will then just become subjective battlegrounds, right, in the worst sense. Uh, and I think that's all I can say without knowing the particulars of that case. So, uh, so to have another epistemological question, unfortunately. Um, or fortunately, yes. <laughs> uh, so given that I and I assume others agree that uh, subjectivism and anti-realism is mm, perhaps not the best way forward. What would, in your opinion, be the best way forward for someone who wants to take an objectivist, realist position to answer the admittedly difficult uh, challenge that the postmodernists present, which is choosing your axioms? And how do you choose those, given you have nothing else to go on? Right, OK. Yeah, so good questions about uh, right where one starts. Uh, here, all I would say is you should take courses right in history, philosophy, and perhaps you're right, you have already done so. Uh, and for me, the important issue is going to be at the level of perceptual right, analysis. Right? Before you get to logic, before you get to concepts, is 
what is the human consciousness's first point of contact with an external world? Right, the standard realist claim is that we have five sensory organs and they put us in, in direct contact with the world. If you can maintain right, that claim, then on the basis of that, you can go on to build up the more sophisticated uh, cognitive things that we can do. Right? We can form abstractions. We can start taking those abstractions and putting them together into propositions, putting the propositions together into theories, right? and then onwards and upwards into more sophisticated scientific method. But my reading of the history of philosophy is that in the modern world, one of the things that plagued right, modern epistemology was that it was not able to defend a direct realism in perception. And that it went to a kind of representationalism. And once you have that big gulf between the subject and the object, that what the mind, or so to speak, is aware of is an internal subjective representation, it may or may not accurately correspond to what's out there. You are in a box that you're never going to get out of. So uh, I would recommend <laughs> two books right, by uh, the people at this point on this issue of uh, perception. And this is not yet going to speak to axioms. I know you asked about axioms, but I think axioms come a little bit later because they are sophisticated conceptual identifications and propositional form. Uh, and that comes probably a little bit later. So, first book I would recommend is by J.J. Gibson, who is a psychologist at Cornell University on the, uh, uh, on the physiology and the psychology of perception. I think he is brilliant, both as an experimental uh, psychologist of perception, and also that he gives a very strong direct response to the Kantian move, right, how, how Kant understands perception. And of course, Kant is drawing on both the rationalist and the empiricist tradition who both had their problems. So I would mention J.J. Gibson, very important. The other name I would mention is uh, David Kelly, right, who interestingly was a PhD student of Richard Rorty's, uh, but on the other side of the, the philosophical map. So just imagine how those conversations went. <laughs> yeah, but another very brilliant man wrote a book in 1986 called The Evidence of the Senses, and in my view it's a, an underappreciated classic of directness of perception. So I would start there. Okay. Hi, Dr. Ritz. Um, thanks so much for the talk. I really enjoyed how you broke down the timeline of the development of postmodern thought. And I guess my question's uh, particularly about basically the last 100 years off the development of that thought. Uh, particularly about existentialism. Um, it seems like existentialism and postmodernism are both kind of like these, um, they kind of take a lot from Nietzsche and uh, Heidegger's uh, lines of thinking, uh, but they're also kind of almost diametrically opposite, like uh, existentialists are pretty into um, creating individual identity, it's very value positive, whereas the biggest crit criticism for postmodernism is very negating. Yeah. Um, existentialism promotes a lot of responsibility, whereas postmodernism puts a lot of blame on the other. Yeah. And yeah, I was wondering if you have any thoughts on why that split happened, because I grew up reading a lot of existentialists, and then I started reading the postmodernists, it was like reading like this ugly, deformed cousin version of it. <laughs> <laughs> that's a nice way to put it, yeah, that's very right. good. Uh, I think that's a, that's a very perceptive question, right? Uh, I think most of the uh, um, existentialists are a generation earlier. Right? So uh, according to the biography, so the leading postmodernists are all coming of age in the 50s, right? but Sartre and Camus are coming of age in the decades right earlier to that. So there's a bit of a chronological difference. But in terms of philosophical uh, categorizations, the existentialists are still trying to do some metaphysics, and they're still grappling right, with the issues of human nature. You know, even though Sartre does say, uh, you know, existence precedes essence and there is no human nature and so on, uh, he's not as radical, right, about that as the later postmoderns, right, will be. Uh, Heidegger, as an existentialist, if you want to include the, the more German, is still trying to do some, some metaphysics, right? He's trying to figure out what really is the nature of being with respect to being, uh, capital B being, right, and so forth. Um, so I would see that the, the postmoderns are a more ruthless derivation of the most empty skeptical parts right, that the existentialists are grappling with. The existentialists are still believing that we can do some metaphysics, that we can find some authenticity, right, that we can find uh, as creators right, some genuine meaning right, in our life. And I believe that the postmodern has abandoned that. Right? That's too metaphysical, that's too positive normatively. 
So, uh, it's, so I know, yeah, what, what was your phrase? A deformed cousin? I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Like, it's, like, okay. it's like the ugly evil. All right, that one should be on the tape. Like, yeah, we should, we should break that one down. But, but but the other the, no, 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 let me just go back up. Obviously, existentialism has a reputation for being kind of gloomy. Your life is absurd. God is dead, and, and we're alone, and then we die, right, and so on. Uh, and all of the existentialists will say, if you are a mature person, you kind of have to go through that phase. And there's, there's some deep truths. But then there is a fork in the road that some existentialists, right, like Camus and, and Sartre, right, in some moods, and some of the religious existentialists want to say, we can start there, but nonetheless come up with a positive program. Right? And the postmoderns are the ones who say, oh, we go there and we just, that's not possible. We actually have to stay on the negative. Path, and they become increasingly nihilistic. So. Uh, yes, okay. Thank you. So you, you talked in today a little bit about how uh, the postmodernists were sort of came of age in the 1950s, and they were confronted with this reality that um, uh, some of these communist ideas were not being born out the way they thought they would. That there were these awful things happening in Soviet Russia and things like that. So I was just wondering. Um, so their tact was to switch. What was important this kind of subjectivity um, and now in 2018 uh, you know I'm fairly confident the American president never read this book or has heard of the postmodernists but we do see this sort of uh, fake news phenomenon in the United yeah. States so I was wondering uh, if in your opinion if uh, like the fake news phenomenon if it's maybe sort of a, a type of weaponization of postmodernism or just your thoughts on uh, the fake news phenomenon in general Right, so yeah, my discussion right of postmodernism focuses really on just the first two generations and then we stop the story. So I think what you're asking is, well, what, what about the most recent generation? And that's, that's a perfectly legitimate question. I think the postmodern strategy is general in one sense in that it can attach to any political program. Right? Uh, anytime you're in an argument, you're losing an argument. Right? And if you say, well, it's just semantics. Right? Maybe you're some breathing space. Uh, uh, and so you, you play that, that, that epistemological card, right, and so forth. Or all facts are just made up facts anyways, and I can just question your sources and add it and I can and so forth. And that's a way of not having to engage right with your argument because I think I'm going to lose right, that particular argument. But the point is going to be that any movement that gets itself in trouble will find itself resorting to those kinds of defensive strategies. And the fact that the, the far left was in deep political trouble in the 1950s and the 1960s, uh, they just got there first. But I think what has been happening is that obviously other parts of the political spectrum are learning that they can adopt those strategies, those tactics as well. So one of the very interesting things is that uh, in the 1990s, this is now one generation after uh, left-wing postmodernism right, is in place, you start to, to read in some forms of theology High Christian theology that they are importing uh, uh, post what we call postmodern themes, but putting them to service uh, in, in, in uh, maintaining a certain kind of Christian, right, religious, right, sentiment. And there, the immediate thing is, well, we're having these battles with these evolutionists, and the evolutionists all have science, facts, logic, right, et cetera, et cetera, on their side, and we can't fight that battle. Right? So what we need is an epistemology that enables us to undermine claim that says facts, logic, scientific method matters in the service of right, the religion. And I think the alt right now, politically right, is doing the same sort of thing. And then people from any part of the political spectrum, if your view is to say, you know, truth and justice don't really matter in politics, all that really matters is power. Right? And we know that there are any number of people in any generation who are that way. They will then say, yeah, uh, fake news and real news, there is no difference, right? Between those two, everybody's playing the fake news game, and our job is just to do it better than anybody else. Thanks. Oh. Okay. Uh, five minutes. So, how about this? Uh, can you each formulate your question in 30 seconds? And I'll try to do, uh, I'll give myself 40 sec five seconds to respond. Wittgenstein closed Tractatus with where we cannot speak, and everyone must pass over in silence. Do you think that the postmodernists misinterpreted this line, much like the logical positives did with the rest of the Tractatus? And if so, was it because of an inability to uh, navigate the paradox put forth by Kierkegaard in fear and trembling with uh, the night of faith? Wow. <laughs> nice. Uh, 
Yes. <laughs> Wittgenstein's enigmatic close to the tractatus, right? Whether he got that right, right, or, or not. Um, I don't think so, right? Because it's an anti-metaphysical move. Right? Uh, just saying there's certain things we can't talk about, so we shouldn't talk about that. It has to close off certain branches of subject. And most of the, the positivist, logic positivists at that point are at least allies to the big consistent project of saying we can't do metaphysics and we can't do normativity, right? There is. Uh, Rorty, uh, whether he, he got it right or wrong, right, when he cites his big three, he does say Dewey, Wittgenstein, and Heidegger. And he's got a certain spin on Wittgenstein, but we can argue about that. But I do think that Wittgenstein is at the very least playing with fire. Right? That feeds into postmodernism. Okay, so as you've highlighted, currently the postmodernists are left-leaning, up to say the least. If they reject power and exploitation, how is it possible to organize a socialist state? And if objectivity is subjective, then how can postmodernists justify the entire nation to trust their one leader to be objectively correct? And by the way, you've described postmodernists and their exploitation of ideology to justify their underlying agenda. Would it be more accurate to label these people as some sort of revolutionist movement rather than postmodernist one? Because they're so detached from the essential skepticism of Okay, wow. That's another... Uh, <laughs> that one deserves a hand, too. That's right. I'm going to take the first part of that question, right, which is say the postmoderns don't reject power. Right? They reject certain forms of power. Most postmoderns will say that basically this, the metaphysical stratum of the universe, if we're allowed to talk about that, just is power. And the only thing is which side of the power imbalances you are on, and there are allegiances to the historically losing in right, groups. And they just want to marshal power, anything's fair, uh, on behalf of their groups to which they have allegiance. So it's only power struggle. Yes. I'm just wondering how you escaped um, becoming a postmodernist yourself at university huh. and what your major influences were. Oh, uh, yeah. Well, I think uh, I escaped because when I went to university, I wasn't planning to be a philosophy person. I was planning to be an architect and, uh, and an engineer because I wanted to build things. So I really just got my undergraduate degree in philosophy for fun because I wanted to uh, have a whole bunch of books to read and know what I was supposed to read when I was pursuing my architecture and engineering career. So maybe that meant I was a little bit insulated from taking it uh, too seriously. You know, uh, but I did take it seriously right when I went to, uh, went to graduate school and then when I started teaching uh, thereafter. So, uh, so I, I mean, the biological, or sorry, the biographical point's not going to carry very far. I think if you're an engineer and you want to build things, you take reality seriously. <laughs> so maybe that's right deeply in my bones. Uh, and maybe that inoculated me from it. But that still then is my good readers to say, well, that just means you're not giving the other side's arguments a fair shake. And there we would have to engage the arguments. Yeah. Uh, hi. Um, I wanted to know, uh, one, th one of the things you find when you're arguing with postmodernism or postmodernist rhetoric, whether it's like a bona fide fan of Lacan or just somebody engaging a bit of sort of fashionable deconstructivism, yeah. is the hypocrisy comes up and they're more than happy to like, oh no, words just, you know, all of this, and we have to keep in mind that language is just made by cisgendered white men to keep their hegemonic control over culture, and then, you know, use definitive words, you know, whenever it's convenient for them. So how can you call that out? knowing that most people in the public sphere, because you're not going to convince that person, you have to convince the people around you, are not going to respond well to you just going, this is postmodernism, look. You know, people will suddenly become very interested in filling the drinks or whatever. So what do you, how do you call that out without being yeah. too deep? Well, I think you always have to be clear who your, your audience is. I mean, if you're interested, if you find someone who fits that category, they're a serious postmodernist, then your strategy either has to be, you know, I like arguing about this sort of stuff and I want to sharpen my rhetorical tools so I'll have a discussion with this person and, and improve. Uh, or you might just say it's just a waste of time because I know postmodernists ultimately, even if I have good arguments and the facts aren't going to change their mind because that's not what their agenda is. Or you might then say that really my audience is people who are listening to us have this debate and I know they've heard those arguments but I want to get my arguments. One thing I uh, find that is useful, though, is um, uh, with, with postmodernists is just say something outrageously wrong about any of the leading postmodern thinkers. Right? So say, you know, uh, Foucault, before he died, uh, uh, said that uh, Ron Green was his favorite president. <laughs> <laughs> and immediately, right, what's going to happen? 
no way, that is false. Right? That didn't happen. So that's a fact claim. And then you, you say, wait a minute, you're saying Foucault really believed certain things, really didn't believe certain things, and you know this? And uh, <laughs> got a performative contradiction. So something like that. Now that's that's a bit cheap, but often cheap shots work, right? <laughs> I get to close. Um, okay, the closer. Okay. Um, I really loved your presentation. Although, I would like to question a bit your second thesis about uh, the origin of the postmodernism. Postmodernism. Okay, post excuse my clumsy English. Um, describing Foucault as uh, building this theory to justify the failure of communism in the fifties seems a bit um, uh, reductive. You know, I think it. it it doesn't cover the broad spectrum of the context of the era, which is the, the war in Indochina at the end of World War II, uh, Algeria was happening at that time. And I think that it is losing some contributions of postmodernism around uh, deconstructing the structure of the discourse uh, where oppression can take place. Uh, Foucault was uh, thinking about madness, about the uh, histoire de la folie. Uh, he was thinking about um, the structures of power in punishment in Surveillé Puné, which are significant contributions in trying to understand what's the role of this course right. in the oppression of uh, within the society. All right, very good. So I would say what you just said about Foucault is exactly right. Uh, but you would also be able to say the same sorts of things about Rorty and Lyotard and Derrida. Each of them is unique. And postmodernism is a bit of a broad label. And they have disagreements right among them, and each of them has different contexts and is responding to a particular issue. So, if we were to drill down to Foucault in the 1950s and his break from from from, uh, from the French Communist Party was one of the things that's going on. His uh, uh, having finished his PhD degrees and working on his first sets of projects, right? What exactly is going on in his mind? He fits into this story, but obviously there are other things that are going on, right, for him, uh, for him as well. Uh, let me just say, though, also, uh, I have been very critical on, on postmodernism, but I do think that all of them are brilliant, and there are some things in, uh, in Foucault that I, that I like, right, because he does have uh, a kind of an anti-authoritarian streak that comes out on a fairly regular basis that prevents him from being lip service to any one right kind of ideology. Uh, and you do get the sense that he's, he, uh, uh, he does have some genuine humanity right, in him, that he's not utterly nihilistic the way some of the other postmoderns are. So for each of these guys as individuals, yeah, there would be a much more nuanced story that, that we would have to tell. So, but necessarily when you scale out at a movement level, you can only say broad stroke things like, Subjectivism and, skeleton, and skepticism are, 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 are operative here in varying degrees among these people. And a certain kind of reaction to uh, coming out of the far left politics is going on, even though the weights are going to be different for each individual thinker. So, absolutely. Okay, I think we're out of time. So, thank you very much.